What I call the world game now is uh, an exercise that I have been uh, following through for a great many years. Can you hear me in back all right? And it started with my being in the uh, United States Navy at the time of World War I. And, uh, I was, was an officer in, in regular Navy, and at that time, <coughs> the United States Navy was being expanded very, very rapidly. The men who had been running the world, due to the fact that the world is three quarters water and the people who ran the water ran the world, found their forces on the ocean top of the sea inadequate. They were challenged by the out ambition, the outside, the, 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 uh, what I call the out pirates to, uh, for the control of the world. And the out pirates surprised them by going underwater and above the water. They'd only been guarding the surface of the water. And they broke their great line of supply by which, which they could control anything anywhere around the world. And they broke it so seriously, the only way they could save themselves was to get the productivity of the, of the United States operative, the industrial productivity, and to have the United States actually arranged to transport that productivity to, to Europe. So they had allowed the United States Navy to come to a parity. They had in the first place that convinced the people of America that it was something you ought to join. And, and so the propaganda that I found myself in as a young man was saving democracy. Democracy was at stake against um, uh, military dictatorships. So that. Uh, they did bring America in, and America then did commit its productivity, and I was in that Navy when the United States Navy, which had been a very second-hand Navy, was being allowed to come up to parity with the British Navy, which had been running the world, and had to be done overnight. And I was in the Naval Academy at the time when amongst a few thousand officers were being trained to really ha handle this enormous expansion of, uh, of the power which, could, which ruled the world. Because at that time, the airplane uh, was, not, was not competitive with the ship at all. We had, we had the airplane, but it was a very small adjunct. It couldn't, could fly across the English Channel, that's all. It couldn't fly across any oceans. It couldn't. We had, uh, towards the end of the war, a plane flew from Norfolk, Virginia, up to Washington, D.C., and that was really the longest flight of the time, to get an idea. So the airplane was, n was nothing. It was there, and it was used, and there, there are dramatic stories of the air battles. And, World War I, but uh, as far as the world power goes, it was not the power item. The power was, was the Navy. I call your attention to the fact that a ship can carry fantastic tonnages and great hitting power and the, the men couldn't carry on their backs and the backs of animals from here to there. And the sea was three quarters of the earth. As we'll begin to look at it, you, I'm going to do a great deal with you on, on looking at, at the map of our world. You'll understand some of these things, but mainly I'm trying to identify for the moment the, what I call the world game. And, and at that time, in the regular Navy, I was introduced to the war games and concepts of how do you run the world. Because I, the, here the United States Navy is being allowed to come in here with the young officers who are going to have to man those ships and command those fleets. And because at sea at that time, even though we had the radio, it was brand new, and we didn't dare trust it for anything really highly strategic, you're sure the enemy could read it. Therefore, you couldn't get from here to there any faster than a man could go on a ship from here to there. Abraham Lincoln had been the first head of state to be wired by the telegraph to his war fronts, his ba battle fronts on the land. Up this time, the heads of of states had to be present at the critical battles to make the critical decisions. So suddenly the head of state could be in a central position and make these decisions by wire to many fronts. But he didn't have any wires to the Navy. So, say, so then even World War I, though the radio had come in, it was a very crude new tool and was not trusted. Therefore, there was no controlling navies, and navies represented the investment of all the science all the chemistry, all the physics, all the mathematics known about our, our universe in this extraordinary hitting power, which could be mounted on and floated in enormous tonnages of great battleships and, and cruisers, destroyers. 
So, in as much as there, they, there were no wires to it, the, the naval officer had to be able to operate completely autonomously. I, I did have several small commands and then was junior officer in very large commands and experienced then the concept of complete autonomy of the, of the captain of a ship or a head of a, a, a commander of a flotilla or a, of the whole fleet. And you had to be able to operate autonomously anywhere around the world and had to understand world patterns. With it then came their World War gaming. And it was very different from the Army games because Navy was, I say, three quarters of Earth is water and the water's touched everywhere. Therefore, the Navy game was always inherently world and dealing with the total resources of the Earth and have the kind of technologies you had. You had to have the right alloys, and the resources of the Earth were very unevenly distributed. Therefore, the Navy was interested in those resources wherever they might be around the whole Earth. And playing the war games, no attention was paid to the, at, 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 at the, any given time, sovereign nation borders. It just simply assumed that uh, the greatest power could knock those down and could make them. Therefore, it was just sort of, sort of things in a very powerful overall way. Anyway, I learned to play that war game, looking at total world resources and thinking in total world. I became fascinated with the idea that here we had this extraordinary technology and, uh, and it was all being developed, just the idea of, of who would, would finally come to contact. Navy, Navy, Navy engagements were completely different from the land. On land, you could engage in siege and, and have long trench warfare. The Navy, you brought out your hardware and finally had to con they called contact and it was assumed that by the second salvo, the second set of, of, of firings, you know who was going to r run the world. You knew who had the best hardware. And nobody knew up to that moment. Nothing was more secret than how you developed, what was on board those ships and what it could do until you came to the moment of contact. Who could outfire the other? And... Uh, so it, it, it was a, a question then of, of uh, developing great, great strategy of using the resources properly to get the highest hitting power for that contact exquisite moment. But I said, here I've learned everything about my ship and how we, uh, the very fundamentals of technology and uh, navigation and ballistics and so forth, how to make great projections and, and how to be, uh, control variable factors and I said, this is something very impressive as a capability. As for instance, I want you to understand something about the way you, you had, the whole Navy had to be designed and it was going to be something that had to be built. And at the time the first uh, steel ships were built, there were no blast furnaces. So it started, you had to have blast furnaces. They had blast furnaces for making steel for the ships at sea for Fifty years for a piece of steel that went and building on the land, just to get an idea. All this technology was developed for this float floatability. And, and, and if you had a steel ship and, and a steam ship, you had to have force draft, you had to have uh, air conditioning was developed down the bowels of those ships. You had to have radio, had to have electric light so you could see what you're doing down 30 feet below the waterline. And so that the, all the auxiliaries were developed of uh, electrical generation. And we had to have refrigeration, where we could keep their food in good order, could keep their men at sea longer. So that all those kind of things developed at sea long, long, for instance, refrigeration was in the Navy for 30 years before it came out on, on, on the land. So I saw all this extraordinary technology taking place and, and that I learned and understood stood it. And uh, I saw that when we came to the problem then, this great, long, comprehensive, anticipatory design of, of, of the Navy, building all the land uh, prime productions, and then going to the Navy yards, and then advanced bases, and, and then you have the ships of the train, and finally the ships of, of the contact line. Then you had to be able to navigate them, so you had to deal with this uh, celestial navigation, and, and you had to really understand the laws of storms and, and, and seamanship in a very big way. And all these kinds of things like weather and storms and celestial navigation were always comprehensive to total world. It was not, not a local affair at all. Then we came to the uh, problem of actually firing. 
I saw that firing from a fixed position on the land a cannon to another fixed position in the land had nowhere nearly the variables that enter in the problem of firing from a moving ship on a heaving sea to another moving ship on a heaving sea. In fact, all the variables were, were there in the way of p permitted degrees of freedom and motions that would be, p be involved in firing from a steerable planet to another steerable planet. In other words, there'd be nothing more in the universe in the way of variables. So I saw this as a very complete and total system, system in which there were no variables left out. And <clears throat> the fact that we were able, at the time of World War I, we didn't have the computers, we didn't have even electrical calculating machines. We did have a, what's called a range keeper up on the bridge, a new experimental device of the Sperry Company, it's called the Ford Range Keeper, but uh, we paid very little attention to it, it was not very reliable. Everything had to be calculated longhand. We had enormous charts in the plotting room, and you had a list of all the variables. We had what we call interior and exterior ballistics. All the things, interior ballistics were all the factors that were going to enter into a firing problem that could be determined before you fire the gun, and the, and the exterior ballistics, all the factors uh, operate on, against that trajectory of the explosively hurled missile after it's left the, left the gun. That is the, the, wind, the wind speeds and, and wind densities, temperatures, uh, the mo motions of the ship, of, of the other ship, and so forth. I learned then how you filled in these, these blanks and how you, how you carried out your formulas and, and became very familiar with these firing problems. And it seemed to me then that there was here in this total undertaking where it was understood then after all this fantastic investment, everything man had ever learned about his physical universe, all going in this one exquisite moment of contact, see which, which of the flagships went down first and, and, and then it's all over for another 25 years. But this kind of a capability did have in it something phenomenal, because it, even to me in, in World War I, the, the fact that we could, you could take a ton and throw it to the horizon and hit the other man on the first throw was a phenomenal matter. Men were not doing anything with that kind of accuracy on the land in relation to trying to make man a success. And it seemed to me a completely different order of capability. And I, I, was, I was shocked that it was only going in this negative thing of killing. This brought me then to thinking about the fact that this might be a generalizable phenomena, that the, the Navy was a special case of a generalized capability to really cope with total, total factors. And you might, if you really dealt with total information and total factors and all the variables and degrees of freedom, you might be able then to apply this towards helping man to, to be a success. So I began to look into this matter and see why was it that this was only going into, into Navy. And it became very quickly apparent that the fundamental raison date was in all of our statecraft was based on Thomas Malthus. I have to point out to you the great difference of a viewpoint that occurred at the time of Thomas Malthus. I want you to think about the way you've been taught history. You've been taught history about Roman empires and, and Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great. And all those empires, as you saw them pictured for you, were on a flat map where the edges were unknown. There was sort of a, a very vaguely filled in information in quite remote land, places, and then uh, it went on to, to unknown, into infinity. But it was a flat plain, a flat plain world, and within that there was a well-known civilization area, and the great empires were those which controlled that well-known uh, civilization area. Outside of them, you came to very dangerous and, and uh, hardly known people, and then kept the, probably to dragons, and then got, you better not go any further. This is, this is the general map. It was not pointed out to us in our history that what is called the British Empire was the first empire which is a sphere. We don't do know that you had Magellan, and you have the information that we're living on a sphere coming into, into operation not long before the beginning of the British Empire. But the point is, you never had it pointed out to the, the, as an empire, it was no longer an open system, but it's a closed system. All the difference in the world. Because if in the open systems of all the old early empires, of, of the Roman Empire, whatever they may be, because they were thought of as a plane going to infinity, there would be an infinity of variables. 
being an infinity of variables, if you didn't like what was going on, there was, there was always a possibility of getting the right God and, and pray to him and everything come out great. So anybody and everybody always has hope. If there's an infinite number of chances, you have an infinite number of hopes, and one of them could come in. So people were hopeful. So they were able to go through very uh, treacherous and ho horrible times because they had hope. When you come to a closed system, it's a very different matter. There are no, not infinite variables at all, and that's all there is, and there isn't anymore, and all the amount of hope and praying won't do any good at all. This is really where the beginning, the beginning of the end of the organized religions would be at the time when you would suddenly start operating in a closed system. Now, Thomas Malthus was the servant, scientific servant of the, the masters of the earth at the time, and the masters of the earth at the time we call it British Empire, but they were not. They were simply masters of the ocean, water, ocean world. They were masters of the world. And they, they uh, stole from the Orient and, and, and sold in, in, the, in Europe. And the British Isles were the most convenient terminal for their, the western end of their run. And, and, it, and the British Isles commanded the most harbors of the most, of the most customers. And whoever could command those British islands commanded the, the great trade. <laughs> And not only were they commanding, they were, they were unsinkable flagships com commanding there, but they, not only were they that, but they were very rich in, in wood and metals, and, and the uh, conditions were very excellent to build you more ships, to rebuild your ships. And, and so they, that's exactly what they did. And they then, hit, they, you can still go to Bristol, England, uh, where, talk about ships coming out, anybody who's been a sailor here, ship-shaped Bristol fashion coming down out of Bristol, Go there today, and you still see the the uh, the, the uh, bar rooms and, and the brothels by the waterfront, where they hit the guys over the head and just threw them on board. And they had to have sailors on board, so they simply they they just they just uh, requisitioned them from those islands, that island. Therefore, it got to be because they, the, that was the personalities you saw around the world got to be known as the British Empire. But it really, was never the ambition of the people on those islands to run the world at all. It just happened to just come out that way. And this is typical of the reversal of history you begin to see when you begin to, to, to study things in, in a holistic manner. At any rate, coming back now to Thomas Malthus and, and his being, he was the first political, uh, he's, he was called prof Professor of Political Economics at the East India Company. He's the first economist in the history of man to receive the total vital statistics from around the spherical earth. They were brought in from all around the world. And in 1800, he wrote his first book in which he said, apparently, man was reproducing himself much more rapidly than producing goods to support himself. 1810, he wrote his second treatise in which he said, quite clearly, man is reproducing himself at a geometrical rate and reproducing and producing goods to support himself only at an arithmetical rate. Therefore, very sad, but man is supposed to be a failure. Now, this is the absolute contradiction of, of the hope that you had in open infinite, infinite variable systems. He did not, was not published to the, to, to the world at all. The world was generally illiterate anyway, and, and, but he, what he had was what we call highly classified information for his master. It doesn't get out in the public domain. Uh, in fact, I, I find Malthus is not really very, very well known. I spoke at the uh, museum in uh, Stockholm to a general university audience about ten years ago, and I asked how many in that uh, Swedish educated audience were familiar with Thomas Malthus, and there were no hands at all. In other words, he really w was so highly classified as, as, as information-based in, in the British Isles, really didn't get disseminated. It, much more is known about him here in America, but due to the, to the relationship of, of uh, England to America. At any rate, Thomas Malthus then had uh, disposed something very fundamental. <coughs> Thirty-five years later, we have the masters of the great water ocean world taking their scientists around the, that closed system to see what the resources were that they couldn't see with their pa pirate's eyes. So, so the scientists saw much more. So they took geologists and botanists, biologists in general, and the bi biologists and botanists were, looked through microscopes. There were no cameras, and they made beautiful drawings of what they found. Amongst those men being taken completely around the world as, as scientists with Darwin, and because you had now a closed system, this is all the living species there are. 
and therefore you are finding a, a design relationship uh, between the vertebrates or, or whatever it might be, they have then developed a closed system concept. Now Darwin could not have developed a theory of evolution in the Roman Empire because he had to include dragons to the nth power or any other kind of animal you wanted to imagine, griffons and, and unicorns. So you can't have these systems until, until they are closable. I want to understand this is one of the most important things I was bringing in to learn my Navy was a closed system thinking that there really are total families of variables and you can, can be very powerful if you really know what the variables are. You have a great deal of general systems today, but I find that people talk about parameters and, and they say, we add this in, but they're making some guesses. They're not t intending to, to discover really fundamentally closed systems. And, and I'll, that will be one of the most powerful things I'm going to introduce to you, how you really assure yourself that you're dealing in closed systems and then you really know just what, what, what you're really dealing with. Now, uh, with Darwin explaining his theory of evolution as survival only the fittest, this was compounded by the great pirates for whom these two scientific servants were operating, Malthus and Darwin, so nowhere nearly enough to go around, survival only the fittest, period. At this point you have then the, the people who are the masters of the earth saying, we have this classified information here, uh, what do we do about it? Nobody ever knew this before. We see all these people out here think there's plenty to go around and, and uh, they don't, these people here don't know about these people there at all. They don't know about these resources. They, they're absolutely ignorant of, of what their world contains and we now have this very startling information. Shall we inform the whole world as rapidly as possible, the whole world at that time being and more than 90 percent illiterate and unable to then to even read any information that was sent to them? Uh, should we try to inform the whole world there's nowhere nearly enough to go around, we divide up evenly and all dies slowly together? And that, 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 that didn't seem logical to them at all. They said uh, we could go ahead the way the, the Greeks were and, and decimate all the excess. Uh, that wasn't, that's a pretty heavy job to do and then pretty gory and un, un, unbecoming. Uh, they said what we can do is the following. We simply, all these people out here are ignorant of what we know about they, and because they're ignorant, they think they have some hope. And we know they don't have hope, most of them. Why, why eliminate their hope? They might as well, they're going to die, poor characters, and you might just as well let, let them die in ignorance. And, and ignorance and hope. That this is the kindest thing to do. And that's exactly what they did do. We really have a, almost a, a deliberate leaving of this kind of thinking uh, wide open, plus the fact that this was highly power, this is really the power structure, how do you run things? They did have the basic information. They knew what they were really going to be up against in odds and why they did what they did. At any rate, it became perfectly clear to me then the statecraft was all founded on this. Now, it was not long after Darwin's pronouncement that Karl Marx in England encountered both Malthus and Darwin's data and agreed with it, that there was nowhere near enough to ground, survival only the fittest. And he said, however, it's perfectly clear that the worker knows how to tend the seed and make the, and, and, and to accommodate nature. Nobody knows about this real mystery, why these things grow, but he knows how to, to accommodate nature. He stays close to it. He's had to work it as a slave one way or another. He also knows how to handle the chisel and all the tools. In fact, he is the fittest because he knows how to cope with nature and that these other people are all parasites. And then the, any, uh, the, the lesser entrepreneurs in below, below the great powers are all parasites. So that was his viewpoint and a very logical one. And uh, we have then the great extremes of politics between the, the, uh, the, Thomas, uh, the, the uh, Marxian worker is the fittest and the great power is saying we are by far the best informed, we are the toughest fighters, most ruthless. And, and, and we really got things running and, and we, we are, we are all, we're the in and we control it and we're therefore obviously the fittest. That's why we're in. And, and our, our independence and, and initiative and so forth is the thing that counts. So these have been the two extremes. So my Navy days, I suddenly discovered that is why this Navy was there because there was a working assumption you nowhere know, nearly enough to go around, a game that you taught as a child to play uh, musical chairs and stop the music and then somebody's left out. <laughs> and I, I, and I was, had it rubbed into me very powerfully and the Navy had pretty rough language about this. And I, I won't 
give you the expression they use, but it was fairly rough about it. You're out. <laughs> I'm in. I'm sorry about you, Jack. <laughs> so I said, 1917, I see this airplane is here, and I got involved with the airplane part and way, and I saw the little submarine sinking a big ship. And I, I realized that in, in our whole Navy was based on the fundamentals of you had to be able to float. <laughs> you want to stay on top of the water. And we go back to Archimedes and displacement. And whatever the geometric volume may be, that volume of water, and what that volume of water weighs, that's all that your ship and all that it contains can weigh. So whoever was able then to have on board, one enemy could, his spies could see what the other enemy's ship builders were building. Anybody could get, could get a picture of that, and you can get exactly her dimensions, and you figure what a volume is, so you can tell what a displacement is. And ships were always talked to in terms of tonnage in that way. So that's what her tonnage is. Now, however, what you put on board, that was a classified thing. Suppose you had mass where the fibers of the wood, there were no knots in it. You knew how, where, after you built your ship, you, you sailed away to another land where there are much better trees. And you, and you careen your ship and put in the better mass. And you went to another part of the world where the fibers were much stronger, as for instance, the Philippine Isles, Manila. And you got that for your ropes. And you got better fiber for your sails in, in Egypt exactly what they did. Then the man who d did that with the same tonnage, when he, his, he, he meets his enemy at sea, and they're only interested in each other. See, the pirates just fighting each other. I point out to you that the laws of the land would never be enforceable out on the seas at all. So three quarters of the earth was outside the law. These people are inherently outlaws, and the only law running them was physical law. And, and uh, you were days alone, and suddenly there's other characters who'd like to take you over, and you've got on some gold on board, some valuable wants to take you over. And who's going, to, who's going to the bottom? So the man who has the strongest mass and strongest fibers and strongest sails waits to engage. In, 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 uh, he can sail a little faster maybe than the other guy. He's got better lines. He designed the ship with the same ton, tonnage but better lines. Or he knows how to handle it better. He's clever at his seamanship. And right, because the earth is curved, 14 miles, you're what they call down under. Hull, hull, hull is out of sight, and, and, and a few more miles, and your mass are out of sight. You could stalk your enemy 25 miles away, and, and he didn't know you were there. And you could come in at night and fast, spot him and then get away and wait for a time when there's a storm. If there's a great hurricane on, he's going, and he's got weak sails and weak mass, he's going to have to take off sail or he'll, 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 he'll perish. So you don't have to take off sail. So you wait to engage him when the winds are really blowing, and, and he's all through. He goes about. So the and nobody and, and nobody on the beach ever heard about it. They don't even know he went to the bottom. Don't know he existed. So the whole superiority and this un, great unknown seas was whoever could do the most with the least. So there was an entirely different kind of a drive on the land. What was going on in the land uh, on, uh, on the sea? What was going on on the land? On the land over great ages, humanity finding a, f a favorable place to survive. I would point out to you three quarters of the earth being water, only then one quarter being dry land, and man thinks of himself a dry land animal. Also, it doesn't take you any time to, to review your experience, realize a great deal of the dry land is great mountain tops and covered with snow and very unfavorable. The actual total amount of the earth which was favorable for the support of life was probably somewhere around 5% of the total surface of the earth. And it was not in one piece, but in tiny little increments. So that the human beings born with hunger, born absolute ignorant, uh, try berries and they get killed, and, and they try the wrong mushroom and get killed, and they see the animals can eat the things, and when the animal doesn't get killed, and they kill the animal, his, 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 his meat seems to be very safe. There's a way you can get, you can't get enough energy through your skin from the sun, you don't really understand the system, there's no science yet, but you just know that you can't, there's no way you can acquire energy unless you get it through your, through your mouth, through your nostrils. And so that uh, this, the animals became the favorable thing to eat. 
and you followed the animals, and animals uh, uh, could cover more territory than you could. They moved pretty fast, and they were able to find the place where nature great, greatest verdure and greatest success. So people got in huddles around the most prosperous places following the animals, and then gradually began to domesticate them and be able to domesticate and inbreed the right roots and, and fruits to keep going. They began local, became localized, and the ones who were successfully localized found themselves being invaded time after again by hordes of people who had, had not been found in good places and were very hungry. And were so hungry, they were very desperate, and they were going to do anything to, 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 to live. So they would come and attack. So the people who found the, the places that were good gradually learned simply to build walls, and built very great walls. And you get the find, uh, we, we've called it the city-state, but you find it through Mesopotamia. You find it very beautifully in a place like in Greece, of um, Mycenae, uh, Mycenae, Mycenae, and you use it, you, uh, this beautiful valley, and in the middle of the valley, a, a promontory. And that promontory can see the whole valley and all the passes for the mountains around, and surveys everything it wants to control. And, and, they, and you get a well. You get a well on your mountain, and they make the walls include both the well and the mountain top. And inside that, you then put great granaries. And when the enemy comes, you simply move everything inside the walls, and, and, and people arrive are hungry, and you inside are eating, and you have your water, and just watch these, these hungry people out. They get weaker and weaker. And when they're good, good and weak, you go out and just uh, kill them off, decimate them, get rid of them. And that's the way it went for thousands and thousands of years. The idea in the land then was the heavier and higher and bigger the walls, the more secure you felt, the bigger the grain bin. In other words, on the, and you didn't, there's no displacement involved. I'll point out to you to our architecture today, buildings, uh, architects don't talk what buildings weigh. You can't get any architect to tell you what a building weighs. People on the land are not thinking about weights of, of structures. On the sea you had to, but nothing was more, more important. So on the land, it was more with more. The more you, you had, the more secure you had. So we have the expression in the insurance company, Prudential, strong, you know, safe as a rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> this is the idea. So I saw in the Navy the absolutely antithesis, the secret, secret, most highly classified way of really being sure to run things. And, and very few people knew about it because there were only a few that were these top characters. The whole story was highly classified and was doing more with less. So I became very excited in 1970 in the idea that with this new airplane, which might in due cause sink an, uh, a battleship, you would do so much more with less, the battleship would come obsolete. And that, this one happened by 1929. That's the time of the great crash. Really, it was a, uh, 1929 identifies this real great shift in, in fundamentals of controls of the world. And I saw the airplane engine and automobile engine started at, as recipi both reciprocating engines, about seven pounds per horsepower as we started World War I. And by 1927, the automobile engine still weighing seven pounds per horsepower, the airplane engine gone down to one pound per horsepower. This is typical of the more with less thing, sevenfold. So if you can sevenfold things, I, I said, I see that. Uh, there's a possibility that we might do so much with so little that we might, by using this comprehensive, if I, if I call what went into designing a Navy and the operation of a Navy, comprehensive anticipatory design science that is really, really brings in all the variables. If I said that's just, the Navy is a special case of a generalized principle, a scientific generalization. Scientific generalization in contradistinction to a, Literary general, general, generalization. Literary generalization is covering too much territory, too thinly, to, to be to be persuasive. Scientific generalization is discovering a principle that holds true in every case. Ever, uh, uh, if there's ever an exception, it's no longer a generalized principle. And so I, I'm talking about a scientific concept here. That Navy represents a special case application of a generalized design generalized comprehensive anticipatory design science as a principle, where you're dealing all the known variables, and really none of them, because you're dealing in closed systems. And, and the, I said there could be in this kind of a competence the ability to do so much more with so much less we might be able to take care of everybody. And the whole reason for war 
is because there's not enough, the working assumption no one has nearly enough to go around. Before the Malthusian time, there's just all we know is that people were hungry and they invaded these other people, and the world is so big they don't think about anything but a very flat, big world. <laughs> they were not thinking of total variables. They didn't have any time to, nor did they have the right equipment to do, do any important thinking. But I saw here in, in this big package of dealing with the total Earth, which had come in with the Navy and the total, total system, there might really be a, a very powerful capability to, to make all of humanity successful. I pondered quite a lot about that business of what, what of war and and support. I'll give you the following. If if it's available to him, a healthy grown man takes on about two pounds of dry food a day. Takes in about four to six pounds of, of water, of liquid a day. And, he, and if it's available to him, he takes on, no, he always, it is available. He takes on seven pounds of oxygen, from, but he takes in 54 pounds of air from which he extracts seven pounds of oxygen. So I really talk about the gross, because you take in a gross amount of, of the dry food and gross amount of the liquid and only certain amounts of it that you use chemically. So the, the gross really is 54 pounds of, of the atmospheric intake in relation to the two pounds of the dry food intake. A man can go 30 days without dying without his dry food. He can go only about a week without his water. He can only go about two minutes without his air. It's very stri strangely different, these, these, uh, these magnitudes. The food is the one that he has really the greatest ignorance about, the chemistry of it. <laughs> The other he is not even asked to think about very much. He did find certain waters poison him pretty quickly. Uh, one reason he got to his wines because his waters were so so generally dubious. And right, the the dry food one, time and again he found himself without food. But he doesn't doesn't perish right away. In fact, for a little while, if he'd been eating too much, it's a pretty good idea to go without and he gets really pretty clear headed. He says, I see now I've been without food here for two weeks and I'm still feeling plenty strong and I better do something about this pretty, pretty definitely. Because he has 30 days to do something about it, <coughs> he very often has organized himself to war, to go after the people who do have. He does know that this over there and, and my side is perishing so I'm simply going to organize myself and do. The water one, he tends to go mad fairly early and does not organize himself very well unless he gets it pretty fast, he's in real trouble. But the air one, he's had so much of. <laughs> the food, the dry food, isn't really, the chemistry is not scarce, but the kinds of chemistry the man knows about that he can take in this dry food was relatively scarce simply due to his ignorance. That's why he, had, he went after the known foods. The waters were not everywhere at all. Men tended to live near waters, and if they still do. <laughs> but the uh, air one, man needs so quickly and, so, so, and, and has such a small tolerance. The nature has provided an enormous amount of that gas, so I find that he has fought over the water from time to time in an oasis, and he's fought just time and again over the f dry food. In fact, I'd say almost all the great campaigns, it might be going after the Holy Grail, it might be the, the, then such thing as the Crusaders. But the men are enlisted by saying, I see uh, you're a pretty big character here and you need, have to eat quite a lot and, and you've just come along with us and we're going to, a bunch of us, we have our arms and we simply take over every farm after farmers have come to and everybody's going to eat. Just kind of stick along here and you're going to eat. Uh, as far as uh, the history goes, we're going after the Holy Grail but you're going, out, you're going to eat. <laughs> a pretty good time going along here. A lot of girls along the way. Now, so armies are organized on, on it's often said arm, armies move on the bellows and they, they're, they're movable by the bellows. <laughs> All right, wars have then very time and again been organized around the food side and, and some, many times even around the water side, but the air one 
nature of seeing that man, she doesn't even wait for him to be hungry. She just automatically breathes. He doesn't, uh, you, you go through thirst and you, and you consciously quench it. And you go through consciously satisfying your hunger. But you're, as a breathing one, you don't consciously, it's just, just pumping in there all the time. And, and ought to be able to have enough of that. Nature provided an enormous amount of this gas. Therefore, we find men do, have not had wars over the air. However, once in a while we have a fire in a theater, and and with the, the oxidation of uh, the oxygen is all gone, and the, and people suffocate time and again. The whole theater isn't burnt down. The people just were suffocated, and you and you see the people after this all over, and and you see a, a father who would very I mean gladly, uh, 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 automatically just give his life for his kids, went mad within the two within the two minutes, and and ran over his own kids. In other words, you find man killing even his own kids. Uh, so when, when it really gets to the vital, vital moment, uh, life will kill life for, for life. When it, when it really it loses, loses, loses its reason and, and acts purely spontaneously, just holding on to that life thing. So I, I, I said I can see then that uh, the air one demonstrates to me that when there is enough to go around, people do not organize for war. That's, that was a very convincing one to me, and it's the one that they were using the most of, and it was, it's such a constant affair that it proves to me that, that when there is enough to go around, there's sort of spontaneous socialization. Nobody ever talks about owning air. You don't have to think about it. You don't think about being possessed. You do hear lots of nonsense about my airspace, and that, that is something else again, which uh, is completely unsupportable, and it's not the same air because keep blowing through over your jungle. <laughs> so, nobody owns the air at all. They can't own the air. Now, therefore, I said, I, I comes my working assumption back in 1917, and very vigorously so in 1927, 10 years later, when I made many calculations that we could do so much more with so much less that we might be able to take care of everybody. This was inherent in what I was experiencing. And the airplane was going to accelerate much more than the ship because it, it didn't float. It didn't even have displacement. The balloon had displacement, but the balloon was no good as a, as a military device. It could be shot down so readily. The air had to have something move very fast and dodge around, and you had to have then the, the Bernoulli principle and the lift on top of the wing foil. In order to do that, you had to pull it through the air at hurricane speed. And to be able to pull something through the air at hurricane speed, a good big thing, there's enormous drag, you're going to have to have a very powerful big engine and a lot of fuel. They're going to weigh a whole lot, and their structure has to be strong enough for a hurricane to start off with. So she, she has to have a lot of weight. Therefore, the amount of weight we are able to lift in the first airplane over and above the weight that went into the structure and into the power plant and the fuel was just enough to carry one man a very few feet in a very few seconds. We've since that time done so much more with so much less in the airplane <laughs> that, uh, that it is a point where there are on the boards of one of the biggest of our aircraft manufacturers in America uh, drawings, and they've been there for three years now, for a ship which will carry 10,000 passengers, vertical takeoff and so forth. This is a perfectly practical matter to be de doing, dealing with. We're already with a 747, then carrying enormous numbers of people very great distances in a very short time. Was, the more with lessing in the air has been absolutely phenomenal. But at any rate, by 1927, I could see that it, it promised. It was clearly promised, and I made many calculations that we could do so much more with so much less, we could be able to take care of everybody. And I saw that because on the sea we were already doing more with less than air we were, I wasn't going to improve that. But on the land where people were not even thinking of building ways, let alone what its performance per pound is, that there was infinite room to make, uh, make improvements. So I made, I'd been in the building world after I got out of the Navy for five years, got up 240 buildings, we were quite familiar with it, and realized there was fantastic nonsense going on in it. Therefore I said, I'm going to make some calculations on what it would take to really control an environment with a minimum and, and give the services necessary to keep the life going inside there. And I found that I could come out with about 1% of the weight of the material that was going into structures, where they're being thought of primarily as a fortress and so forth. And they could be air deliverable and so forth. So 
I said, I, I see I'm going to make some more calculations along those lines. And in fact, if we I became, took no trouble at all calculating the way they were building houses in 1927 to discover that you could never take care of all of humanity. There wouldn't be enough to take care of 25% of, of humanity with that kind of tonnage if, in, in, a, in a dwelling or, or a housing establishment. The amount of just the weight of the plumbing per capita is a fantastic kind of a figure if you're going to have any st high standard of living at all. So I, I therefore got into the studies to see how, what, whether I, there was any reasonable, fees was I within feasible uh, range of, of, of a good theory that it might be possible to take care of everybody. In, in calculation in 927 regarding all the things that I gave a name called living in contradiction to, to weaponry. If I apply this high capability to living room, because living room is a very complex affair due to the fact we are processing. You can't just talk about just the enclosure. You have to take care or take care of our chemical processing. So, so getting into living room, my calculation made it perfectly clear in 927. It was highly feasible to make the world's resources take care of everybody. So at 927, I then said, I'm going to go back to my Navy war game where I play totality and get all, and I start really getting together the, a comprehensive anticipatory design science inventory and get all the variable factors that, that, is, that is going to enter in this problem and I'm going to start playing my game. How, what are the first things first that you're going to need to make man a success? What do you do starting from where you're starting with, I, I didn't have any money and I don't, I, I, I didn't find anybody who was interested in doing what I was doing. And I saw it was going to take, if he undertook it, it was going to take a long, long time. The first fruits of it could not probably be uh, effective until 25 years and total around 50 years before any really important degree of uh, effectiveness would be manifest. So I, I ended in the, on that very long distance thing. I found man was very short-sighted and all his corporations were being managed on the basis of this year's profit or at least next year's profit. And they're not going to be president of that company much longer than two years if you don't make a profit. So the man was in short-sighted and the politicians were looking around for the next election. And, they, and I saw things that to really do it properly are going to run into at least a quarter of a century. And really, it was a lifetime undertaking that I better not touch it unless I committed myself to the rest of my life, and I was 32 at that time, so I said automatically, I, I see that this is such a, the fact is I see it, and I know it can be done, and I can't find anybody else who is interested enough. I find people sort of entertain it, like they have to come to dinner, sort of kind of interesting guest. That's about the most uh, they listen to. and. Uh, so if, if something was going to be done and I saw it there, I, I, I just simply I say I don't really have, have much, but I, I'm going to see what, what I can do. In fact, this makes it quite interesting because I'm convinced I'm a pretty average character and I'm interested in what humanity can do and not just what some, some genius can do. So if, how can I handle a non-genius average character to uh, starting on my own initiative without any economic advantage at all, none of the ca corporation, um, advantage or the great great government advantage, what do you do? What are the first things first? What are, what are the order priorities things have to be done? What, what are, you get at your total factors and then out of all the things that have to be done, what has to be done first that will be most effective? So well, certainly I got into energy as the thing we're going to, we have to regenerate life, how to get energy from here to there and so forth. Now, mainly this is just introduction to you, and I'm trying to identify what world game is. So at that time, I was using a language of my Navy, and I'll tell you, on, when you're on the bridge of a, of a ship at sea, either as captain or you are officer of the deck and have the authority of the captain in lieu of the captain, maybe asleep, uh, what we in command, you, you are conning. You, 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 are, you, uh, you, you say what has to be done. It really is very interesting because it does come from a, the, um, the mind and so forth, and the mind is, is directing things. So you have a conning tower on a submarine because that is the point where, where the command is occurring, but at any rate, while you're under operation, is conning. So I used to call it a conning tower operation, and then I, and I t did call it 
uh, the, the world, uh, I called it world planning and things like that. My phraseology went through quite a number of changes. Then I began to develop ways of, of seeing how I would bring all the resource information, all the things I needed variable into some central point as I would have it on the bridge of a ship or in the control room in the, in the bowels of the ship. Because on the ship for the Navy, they, they wanted to be sure that, that the control was in a place that's safer, so they really had down in the bowels of the ship, they, they had the, 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 all the, the, the battle uh, st uh, strategies were worked out, not, by, not up, uh, up on the bridge. And there was a secondary bridge, a second place where you could steer the ship if something went wrong on the main bridge and so forth, down the stern and so forth. You had the different battle station, but I, I said, I'd like, here's the control room. And uh, I began to develop ideas of control rooms. And what, I, as I began to get, be familiar with my own factors, all the things I was dealing in, and my, my strategies, I, I wanted to have better and better headquarters. And, and I kept having sort of dreamy theoretical headquarters. Where I had to get on wherever I was, of course. But I kept saying what, how, how, how I could improve the, the situation by having better began to develop an uh, idea of a, of a miniature Earth so you could see your whole Earth. One time I then used to call it mini-Earth. Another, another time I, I finally and it, it had a, said we have a... The gyroscope is developed so a scopist so you could see the motion of the Earth. You could understand the behaviors of the Earth through the gyroscope, scopus. So I, I got up a word, geoscope. <laughs> so we could really see our whole Earth in some proper way. This brought me into cartography and many other things, of course. Gradually, I came back again to this name, World, world Game. One, uh, one time I called it World Town Planning. <laughs> 1927, I think that was the name, 1927, World Town Planning. Anyway. I want to identify what I'm talking about, world game. I've been playing world game for a long time, and all the things I've done since that time have come out of the sets of priorities, the first things, the things that need to be done, and where you start on your own, and, and gradually finding what, as you do the things, and, and they, the time is beginning, getting riper and riper, the, uh, then more and more human beings became involved with me, that I, that I quite clearly were, had been anticipating properly and coming into, I'm coming into phase. I'm really very much in phase right now at the point where we're, t we're talking this world game to I find myself being asked to, to speak to others. I'll tell you many of my strategies as, as I have time for today, but I have, have priority to give you the, what I think are the most important items at the beginning. I would say a little about how we conduct ourselves, having started out all on my own. First place I said, Never ask anybody to listen to you. There are too many people. <laughs> and, you, and, and, and when you ask somebody to listen to you, he, he doesn't want to be persuaded. He's just going to act like a fisherman. And he's going to play you on his line. So I, I will never get anywhere to do that. I will only talk to people when they ask me to talk to them. So that, that's been absolutely fundamental in my life. You, you and in fact, have asked me to talk to you. I don't know how you got here. <laughs> Uh, but but I, I'm talking to you because you asked me to, and I, and I know when you ask me to, then you're probably going to be doing some good listening. I said I, I'm absolutely convinced that the condition, uh, how powerfully people's reflexes get conditioned, even though they say they would like to change themselves, you just try to stop yourself doing something that you have a habit, you find out how difficult it is just handling yourself, let alone trying to persuade somebody else. Therefore, I said I'm not going to try to reform my fellow man. I'm perfectly convinced that when that the environment persuades him. If he comes to water, he, he doesn't try to go in with all his clothes on. He takes his clothes off. <laughs> he behaves in certain logical ways in, relation, in response to whatever the environment does. So if I develop an environment that is going to be very favorable for him, he will employ it in a favorable way, very spontaneously. That's all. If I've got a glass and he needs water and I've invented a glass, he's going to use that glass to drink out of. He won't keep drinking out of his hand or try and lap it up with his tongue. So that... Uh, I, I said, I'm going to, I see that nature has all these, she's continually transforming herself. Transformation is, of the universe is, is inexorable. It is entropy. Every system is giving off energies, and energy is given off in irregular ways, and they affect other environments, giving off their energies. So the situation is continually changing. 
the biologicals change it even more. <laughs> And, and then the change in environment requires adaptation of those biologicals. So that, what you call evolution, this constant inexorable change, is, is such that I find that it has ways that are permitted degrees of freedom. It has ways in which it does it. Those ways are employable. In other words, there are, there are options within it, very important options. And we're born with the realization we have some options to what we're going to do. And it's not just yes or no, they're, they're, how, many, how many options are And I began to say, if I go and understand my general systems, I want to know how many degrees of freedom there are, how many kind of options. Then there's a frequency in which you have options, and the frequencies of our universe are very, very high, so that with a great, I find that there are literally six positive, six negative degrees of freedom. And with a very high frequency of event, you have chances to, you, you come out of things that seem, you seem to be absolutely free with, with that high frequency of numbers of choices with that many degrees of freedom. So I said, I see that it's perfectly permissible to rearrange the scenery in preferred ways to, to uh, complement the regeneration of, of human life. And uh, you'll have to be very considerate of all the interplay of all the biologicals, the gases being given off by the vegetation which are necessary for the mammals, the mammals giving off the gases necessary for the vegetation. There's that interplay going on all the time, therefore you'll have to be ecologically considerate throughout everything you do. There's a great chemical interchange going on always. There's no such thing as waste. <laughs> chemistries are always needed here and there. The universe is always using its chemistries. So that uh, if, you're, if you really are knowing and knowledgeable and, and look, de dealing some totally, uh, there, was always, uh, there was always a disposition of, every, of anything you differentiate out. The, the different paths go in different directions, preferred directions. But not not a random. They don't just dump dump anything. That is a, that is an act of great ignorance and short sightedness. So those those are the, uh, this is more or less the way the world name world game got started. And now you have have a little idea of what it is about. And, and I say I have been employing it, and I've now gotten some quite good results. As for instance, I said to you I was going to look on the land side where man lives, not on the water and the air where I saw great scientific effort was already being applied to do more with less. And it's where he was not thinking about when 99% of humanity dwelt that he wasn't thinking about more with less at all. He's doing exactly the opposite, more with more. And I would, then I would, therefore I would undertake to design enclosures and, and environmental living, living advantages quite independent of whether he thought he would like it or not. That wasn't my task for the moment, but it's to find out what was involved and, and to design it effectively to do the most, do the most for the least and, 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 no, and, and continually to increase his degrees of freedom. I'm, I must not impose restraints, but go exactly the opposite. And not only freeing it in his motions, but also freeing his time, which has already had up to this time been required for his eight hours for sleep or so much looking out for the fact that he is, he is a process, he has to clean himself, whatever it is. Many things I found himself having to do just to be able to live. And I found myself as a kid then having, I had to tend the furnace. And, and uh, the, the, the family parish they didn't have, have that heat in the house, etc. And they had, somebody had to take out the ashes, so you did that. I, I found a great deal of my time was involved. So I said, any of these things that I can do in, in a, a way which, uh, where I use energy of nature, which is f moving around freely as the rain falling from the sky and coming down the hills, anything I can do to shunt these patterns of, of energy through wheels, to, uh, through levers to get work done is permitted. <laughs> and so I would sum totally, I'm not going to go into those further those strategies for you except to say that I have in, in those interim years then found out how to employ resources in such a way as to get important environmental controls with no absolutely free, no columns involved what they call clear span space. And I said, in, in developing this kind of equipment, I must be able to produce it with the most importantly advanced tools man knows about, and must be able to, to distribute what is needed wherever it's needed at, in the shortest possible time. I must be able to make a, a delivery of, of, a, of, a, of a living machine 
to any point anywhere and within a few minutes when somebody wants it that's where they want to live okay we got to bring, deliver it and be able to take it away and not something you're going to have to impose on him he has to buy he doesn't have to buy anything i'll be sure that he gets a facility where it is when he needs it therefore not only does it have to be very light and flyable but reproducible and employing by far the best techniques man has ever discovered both production distribution and service and, and return and recirculation of, of the of the resources you take them out you've got a better way of doing it. you melt up those met all those metals and get them recirculating do more you have to be responsible all the way through and never getting rid of something just in order to, to exploit somebody or some situation you don't go in any, any, any exploitation whatsoever. You're not allowed to think exploitation. It's perfectly easy to see, it, as I began to get these things, uh, great power. I could see uh, no time at all how you can make millions. <laughs> I said that's exactly the opposite of what I'm being inspired by. I'm being inspired by man's needs and an awareness that he could really be successful. And all this money making is so short-sighted that it's get, really getting us into trouble, and that's what I'm c coping with. I see that man, the more I studied what I was studying, the more I could see that he was really on, on route to very great, to almost uh, probably to perishing. And, uh, and uh, so I became all the more inspired to, to, to drive hard. I'd like to uh, spend some time now, invest some time, and incidentally, I haven't been through these things many times, and I would continually live with and review and had to use my own head as a computer to store a tremendous amount, but again, not having money. And, and so I'm simply forced to discipline myself to be as effective as I know how. Therefore, I can stand up and think out loud and, and draw from the inventory of the experience. It's, it's very, very live, all, all of it. And, uh, and, I, and incidentally, reviewing something, because to have it in our documentation, because we are documenting here, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing as, as competently as I know how and as comprehensively and thoroughly as I know how because I like to have this documentation one which could be used to start other games instead of having to I like to be able to mass reproduce the effort and I find myself spending much too much time going from here to there just geographically to be able to communicate with a relatively f small number when we really could uh, multiply the information so I'm trying to do this in that kind of a manner in order to be able to do it well, I also then done some sleeping because I, I knew that I, I behave much, I can, I'm much more effective when, I, when I am, I'm not tired. And so I've, I've got myself as ready as I can to do as good a job as I know how. I want to give you some uh, feeling about comprehensive systems and where you may be, may, the kind of way you challenge yourself. <laughs> to discover whether you really are dealing in, in, in totality. I have the uh, option thing I'm hesitating is I have a sort of an option of uh, employing uh, my own sort of pattern of spontaneous excitations of what makes me say what I say and I have many times found it very useful to point out the the in inadequate way of looking at things before you show the adequate way <laughs> And, and, it's, and, and you really tend to appreciate the adequate way more if you have realized the inadequacy of ways in which you have been looking at things. So I'm going to invest just a little time in, in the inadequate ways in which I'm confident every one of you are still thinking. And, because I have caught myself in this condition and done everything I can to get myself out of that inadequate way of thinking. As for instance, I'll point out to you that you, we've, you started off school and suddenly convinced that your parents love you very much and they, they want you to have the very best chance. They want you to use your mind because they, they identify education with some success and, 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 inf and ignorance with pains that they have had themselves. They hope that their children are going to be able to avoid. So they hope you're going to get a very beautiful education. 
and, and the mothers, uh, what they really put in that, get a little child going off to school, the, the love that's in there is just fantastic. So we say to the darling the child, all right, now, I'm going to let you just draw pictures today. So you just draw pictures for a while, and then uh, I'm going to expose you to a number of experiences, maybe in the Montessori manner, whatever it may be, but I've gotten you to understand a little arithmetic, and, and, I've, and you've drawn pictures. So I say, now I'm going to, having, you, having learned your arithmetic, I'm going to show you a way which we can put the arithmetic and the pictures together, and you do, do something we call geometry. But I want to make it nice and simple. I'm sure you've heard that mathematics is very difficult. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, it's not going to be a difficult part. I'm going to start the simplest part, called plane geometry. Solid geometry is very difficult, and, and spherical trigonometry is awful. But the, this is very easy, plane geometry. So I'm going to start with a plane, which is obvious, so plane geometry, I'm going to start with a plane. And this plane, I'm going to draw a line on it. This line goes to infinity, and that direction goes to infinity that way. So the little child said, which way is infinity? <laughs> uh, say, darling, well, I could draw the line this way, so it might be infinity that way, infinity that way. And the child, So the child is a spontaneously a scientist and, and wants experimental-based information. And, and a child he knows enough to say, have you ever been to infinity? <laughs> and T said, of course not, Don. And said, I just want you to believe there's infinity. <laughs> so we start in with a belief here. It's a very tough kind of a game right away. <laughs> so now you... <laughs> You got a nice straight line, and she draws a straight line. And, and if you look at it, you say, Teacher, don't think it looks straight. Sit down, of course, I can make it look straighter. <laughs> but uh, if, this, if, this, if this student pursues it, he discovers that you can't make a straight line. Physics has found no straight lines. What physics has found characterizing its physical universe is that every chemical element. Every physical phenomenon has, is identifiable by its waves. <laughs> Everything is wave. You have only wave. That's absolutely what is unique about it. That's, that's what's f fundamental going on in this room. Everything is wave. So you say that, oh boy, go straight. He can't. He has to go crooked. <laughs> <laughs> so when he's nice and natural and he's a good crook, you, 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 uh, you find fault with him. Now, this is typical of, of our ignorance of being operative here. I want you to think, and, and physics has found no solids. Physics has found no continuums. Found only discontinuous energy events. <laughs> it's remote from one another as the, as the stars in the Milky Way, uh, proportional to their diameters of the events. So to start children off in solids and planes and straight lines is absolutely starting, loading them up with, with a, a uh, called axiomatic, with, with, with assumptions that are just uh, untenable in terms of what physics has found out. I want you to think about a great screen we have here, uh, you've got an outdoor moving picture, the biggest screen you've ever seen. And we're going to flash onto that a beautiful picture taken through one of the great uh, Palomar telescope of some portion of the sky. It's maybe only one ten thousandth of the sky, but it's a great star pattern and just filled with the beautiful stars. And you have an important astronomer there, and he can tell you our sun star is very small, and one of the, the smallest little white dot in that great screen is about the size of our sun star. Then we find that our we're 92 million miles away from that star, which luckily we won't burn up. And the next nearest star to our sun star takes light coming at 700 million miles an hour. It takes four and a half years for it to get to us from the next star. That's, that's a little idea of the distance between two stars, between our sun star and the next nearest star. Four and a half years at 700 million miles an hour. So as you look at this big picture here, I have uh, well, it's one ten thousandth of the sky, and there are two, there's a smallest little white dot on there, and then the next white dot to it. 
They could represent our, our sun and the next star very, very appropriately. So on this enormous screen, I'd like to t t get some kind of a pointer, and we'll get a very sharp point. And we try to figure out, <coughs> pick a little distance, about halfway between those two stars. And this might be where a planet of our star would be in relation to this. So this is one ten thousandth of the sky, and this absolutely invisible point between these two smallest white dots might be where our planet is. And I want to have a little balloon voice, as you have in the cartoons, rising from this point, where it says, never mind that space stuff, let's get down to Earth, let's be practical. <laughs> How many times you heard that? How many times you said it yourself? Recently, the moon shot. We are a space program and nothing else but. <laughs> what a space program. And as we begin to catch on to a space program, we're all through. Superbly designed little spaceship. That's the thing I want you to get in your mind very, very powerfully. It is a tiny little closed, beautiful chemical system <laughs> which had had man on board for two million years without knowing he's aboard ship. That's why I can keep on saying, never mind that spaceship, let's get down to Earth. Where is down to earth? What do you mean to say down to earth? That is coming to the concept. We had all the men up to the time of my father, in total lifetime, nobody has seen more than a millionth of the surface of the earth. So he's not, he's not to be blamed that, he, that it looks awfully big and, and, and a plane. But our expression down to earth comes from our concept of a sort of a an infinite sandwich. The infinite sandwich, our Earth is the, it's all the meat of it, and there's something, the sky in this direction, there's heaven, there's hell. Things have been so fairly propitious for man during the last half century that he's beginning to give, forget the word hell, but we used to have a great deal of thinking about the hell side of the sandwich. It's sort of being dropped out now, so we just practically have the Earth left and the, and the, and the space, our Earth and sky. If any of you use the words up and down, the words up and down were invented to accommodate the concept of an infinite plane, and it's, an, it's a plane, then all the perpendiculars to a plane must be parallel to one another. Therefore, they can only go two directions, up and down. So if you use the words up and down, you're still thinking down to earth. You say, I know much better. I've seen the, the pictures of looking at the Earth and the moon and so forth. I'll simply point out to you, all of your scientists still see the sun setting. There's a very great difference between how you organize your, how your, re, your reflexes are uh, conditioned and what you know theoretically. As, as I science is still, it knows about our Earth <laughs> as a separate planet and so forth. It knows that the, the, the sun is not going around the Earth and going down. But the point is, its nervous system sees it going on, and that's the way it's reflexing. So in its spontaneous reflexing, it is, it is at least half a millennium behind its, its theoretical knowledge. So all of you are way out of gear with your theoretical knowledge. We have in navigation a sea something called dead reckoning, you have, and you have celestial navigation. In your dead reckoning, you keep track of the compass course you are running and how long you've been running it. But the fact is you don't steer very accurately. You find you're veering by that point all the time. You don't really know how much you're accumulating error on one side or the other. You don't know about your ocean currents and, and the winds, what the winds are doing to you. So that if you're running in a fog and there's no chance for a celestial observation, maybe running for weeks, and you, when you finally make a, a get a really good mathematical fix, you find it very far off from where you thought you were. I would, I would point out to you that I think our world society has been operating on a, on dead reckoning, fundamentally dead reckoning. That's where the local visible tools and, and, and uh, is very, very far off from where it is in evolution. I'm, I'm confident evolution is doing uh, that first place that we are, we're experiencing what we're experiencing as part of a fantastic design where the, the kind of mentality that we have on board of that little spaceship there and, 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 and saying, let's get down to Earth, never mind the space stuff. The typical, typical of our arrogance and, 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 and uh, egocentricity <laughs> and just really thinking that we are fundamentally responsible for everything going on. So I, I find 
through, through these years that I've been playing the world game, I find man time and again doing what he is, needs to do, but he's doing it for all the wrong reasons. I find him really, what I call, backing up into his future and doing the right things for the wrong reasons. So he's been, he's been uh, excitable by, and so group excitable, because he also has terrific inferiority complex, doesn't want the other man to know how relatively ignorant he is. He wants to keep showing off as part of this sort of survival mechanism. That, where it doesn't seem to be anywhere nearly enough to go around the old Malthusian idea <laughs> that he, uh, he doesn't want to let on. So he only really lets on and agrees to things in, uh, over really obvious, something obviously very threatening. And obviously very threatening was group war, where your, your, your side is being invaded and so forth. And then you give great mandates. So I find the mandates for war, ability to make war, have been the only important mandates we have really given during something called peacetime, we, we uh, pull back and, 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 and start making do with what the powerful people keep making do with the way they've been making do and preserving their position. Now, I gave you the, the this. Uh, I want to get you a new awareness of the fact that you are probably still thinking down to earth. <laughs> Practicality. Uh, to re make you realize that, that, that you're really dealing in, in infinite systems rather than closed systems in, in, your, in your tendency of thinking, even though you, you've seen that, the ball. But there are a great many kids who have been born since that time who will start with, with that feeling. And, and they're going to, they're going to, their reflexes will be conditioned other than the, the people who before, because in 1927 when I was starting playing world games seriously in Chicago, there was a, there was a town north of Chicago, there was a man taking another well-known political name, Bolivar, but anyway, he had a, a whole, he had a whole town organized on the basis they, they all subscribed to his idea that the earth is, it was absolutely flat. <laughs> And uh, uh, all the rest was nonsense. The man was kidding himself that about being on a, on a sphere. He would not have much chance since, since the moon shot has taken place. But, the, but, but in 1927, it was easy to maintain that. The, the man might ever go to the moon. Nothing could seem more remote. In fact, if you wanted to really demonstrate that a man was, was uh, completely uh, irresponsible, and, and, and his brain was deranged. What do you call him? A lunatic. As Luna, the moon. Anybody who thought they might touch and go to the moon would, would be... That, the, 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 the essence of being crazy, to really test a man as crazy, incompetent to be, that he'd say you could go to the moon. A lunatic. Okay. I'm going to show you a slide, and I'm going to pick it, go fairly fast. I'll have to pop some of the slides through to get to the right slide. I, th this would be a good place to start. You. Uh, Because we started our children off on plain geometry, as we came to various geometrical figures and began to find the, the Euclidean, everything in Euclidean, in plain geometry. I, I could shut this off for a minute. You're very familiar in your, your geometry with having had a triangle and the definition of a triangle being an area bound by a closed line of three edges and three angles. A square was an area bound by a closed line of four equal edges and four equal angles. A circle was an area bound by a closed line of equal radius from a central point. All the geometries that you would start off with in your plane geometry are always areas bound by closed lines, and then you learn how the relationships of the, the right, dropping the right, right angle from the, from the, perpendic the perpendicular in, in, the, in the, 
non-right triangle and, and getting a right triangle and learning the laws of the, the interrelationships of those angles. At any rate, you start with geometries are areas that abound. Now, this gets to be something quite interesting because, as somebody say, the only thing that you know about is on one side of that line in the bound area, and that gets to be, you can understand it, it's logical, it's subdivised in very beautiful arithmetical ways and, and very great reliability. In fact, it gets to be a closed system because you find the sums of the angles of the triangle always add up to 180 degrees, no matter whether scalene or, or isosceles or equilateral. It doesn't make a difference how large it is, it comes out with the same number of angles. That's very beautiful. The, the angles seem to be something independent of size, of the size of the object. Now, why do you then, why is a triangle then, or, no, why are these geometries only definable as areas that are bound? simply because on the other side of the line, being plain geometry goes to infinity, therefore it's undefinable. Okay? So you, you can only have definition and understanding on one side of a line, seemingly. That's where we start our children off. So you start off your children with a very great bias. The reliability and calculability is within this beautiful confined area, so reliability is within fences and, and walls and... and the property and in my family, my house, domain. You get the, there's a domain of reliability. <laughs> and the, out here is unreliable. And so the people next door, I don't know about them. In the next town, they're even more, more unreliable than in other countries, they're awful. Very ignorant cannibals. Yeah. So you ask a, a, a child to, to draw a triangle. He said, where should I draw it? Well, you're outdoors, no other place. You just draw it on the ground. So draw it on the ground. So he draws a triangle. And you say, you've drawn four triangles. And he said, no, I've only drawn one. So you have to demonstrate to him that you've drawn four triangles. Because that is a fact. Because a triangle, then, is an area bound by a closed line of three edges and three angles. So he has to draw it on something. He said, where should I draw it? And, and he, you can't draw unless you're drawing something. We have to be very literal in science. This is a fact. If you want to draw, you're, going to have, you're either going to deposit some... I've left... I've deposited some chalk on, the, on here. I've added something to the system, I, but I did it to the board. The board has an edge to it and has a back to it. It's a closed system in itself. And so I've added something to it, or else I could have taken a knife and I could have scratched it away. I could take something away from it. But I will alter the system. This is a trajectory of the effect of myself as a system on this other system. <laughs> There's an interaction between systems here. When, and this is, this is why this is, uh, I'm talking to the way Percival Bridgman talked about Einstein and developed what he called operational, this operational procedure. What, what is in the experiment? What, that's all you ever know. Because Einstein says all you ever know is what's in the experiment. You must start with experience. Science begins with experience. So you recognize that uh, being a system, and it's sort of an asymmetrical one, it's a flat one, a sphere would be an easier system for us to think about for the moment than a, than a, than a rectilinear form such as this slab. I, I could take it off its hinges and hold it up for you and look at all, look it all over. It would have then six six main faces, back and front, and four small, small narrow edges. Let's look at our Earth. Now I'm going to, to uh, make a closed line on my closed Earth, and it's, it's going to be the equator of the Earth. So I, I put a closed line on a closed system. Because we recognize this, everything that you can ever affect is going to be a closed system in itself. Therefore, I've divided this total Earth into the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. That's perfectly clear, isn't it? In other words, a closed line on a closed system divides the area into two areas. You can give them any name you want, but they're two areas. And both, of them are, both of them are defined by the closed line, the area bound by the closed line. So, supposing instead of making the equator, 
I make it as the Earth, and, and I go to 80 degrees north latitude. I divide the whole Earth into, into two areas, a very large southern and a very small northern. It's still, still perfectly clear. They're both areas bound by closed lines of equal, equal distance from a common point, the radius. That's what they call a circle. So instead of having the Earth having circles, supposing I, I went up near the North Pole and I drew a triangle, I divided the total surface of our Earth into two areas, haven't I? It would be just as good as if it was a circle. So that there, you can call this a southern and this is a northern triangle. This is a southern triangle and it's an area bound by a closed line of three edges and three angles. You said, I'm not used to seeing that big kind of a triangle. In fact, I've been taught that the sums of the angles of a triangle are always 180 degrees, so there's something wrong, because this would be 300 degrees each year. So I, I have to now show you that the sums of the angles of a triangle don't, don't add up to 180, and they never have. <laughs> so it's again where you're misinformed. We're going to start at the north. We have something we call a great circle or a geodesic line. A great circle on a sphere is a line formed on a sphere by a plane going through the center of the sphere. This is the center of the sphere. And that's the, the, be the equator would be typical. Or it could be one of the meridians. This is the North Pole here. You start at the North Pole, and this is a meridian plane, great circle. You can see where, where the, this is the great circle plane that went through the center of the sphere and, and cut the as a meridian here. And it impinged on the equator here at 90 degrees automatically because the the equator was generated by the axis of the Earth, and the, and this, and the equator is then in the plane at 90 degrees to, to the axis of the Earth. Okay? So we leave the North Pole on a meridian, and we come down to the... Oh, just to be, show you, great circles are the shortest distance between points on a sphere. Here, here is the equator of the Earth again. I'm going to take the... Let's go to... 87 degrees north latitude, or 89 degrees north latitude, a tiny little circle up here. You take that little small circle and superimpose it on the equator. This is less a circle. It doesn't go through the center of the sphere. It does go through the axis, but it doesn't go through the center. Okay? Would you agree this little lesser circle, as you, as you draw a very small circle, you just make the plane of it. It doesn't go through the center of the sphere here. The equator does go through the center of the sphere. Is that clear? The next latitude up here, parallel to it, does not go through the center. <laughs> the center of the sphere is here. So this, 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 uh, this uh, 80, 80 degrees north latitude is a circle, all right, but it does not go through the center of the sphere. I'm simply saying to you, only the great circles, which are the ones that do go through the center of the sphere, they are the shortest distance between points on a sphere. So I took this small little circle from up here and superimposed it on the equator. So it went through, it crosses the equator at two points, A and B. Quite clearly, it's a much shorter distance between A and B on the equator than it is on, on the detour, right? All I want you to understand that we use then, these are called geodesic lines. They are the shortest distance between events in the universe, because the universe we've found nothing but waves, so all the lines are curvilinear. And, 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 and uh, there's some very large arcs, some very, very small ones, but they're always curv curved. And, and so we're interested in the, in, the, in the geodesics or the most economical relationship between events in the universe. Just to give you a, sense, a little sense, uh, I don't know why anybody wants to kill a bird, but if you do want to shoot at a bird, you don't shoot where the bird is if it's in flight. You, try to, you shoot where it's going to be when the bullet gets there. So you call leading the bird. Gravity is always operating on the bullet too, so it's pulled. There was some wind blowing. If you're shooting really quite some distance, you'll see is a corkscrew. In fact, during World War II, there were many pictures made at night, photographs made at night from one airplane in a group of planes in a dogfight, and where they used tracer bullets. And you see one plane hitting, hitting the other, and, and, and there are always these corkscrew lines. As these are the geodesic lines. They're the most economical relationships between events. We are in a universe which is omnidynamic and all in motion. These are simply the most economics, and they're always, they're always corkscrew. There can't be anything else. At any rate, 
The most economical relationships are called geodesics, and so great circles are geodesics. <laughs> They're most economical between points in the surface of our sphere. I want you to point out then that I'm using geodesic lines and doing what I'm doing now. I've started the North Pole, taken a meridian, pinched it on the crater at 90 degrees. And I'm going to go one quarter way around my Earth, then go back up to the North Pole again on another meridian. Therefore, I have to leave the equator at 90 degrees, don't I? Because the meridian impinges. So I get back, and I've been a quarter way around this, looking down on the top of it. It's got to look like that. Therefore, this must be 90 degrees here. So you have 90, 90, 90. This is the most economical basic triangle. That's what, this is what, where you do your spherical trigonometry with your great circles. So here's 90, 99, adding 270 degrees. I bisect the edges of that triangle, put another great circle triangle in here, and you'll find the angles here are somewhere around 72 degrees. If I bisect these edges again, the angles here will be somewhere around 63 degrees. Bisect again, and the angles are going to be 60 degrees in some minutes. Bisect again, going to be 60 degrees in some seconds. And finally, but you, it never gets down to exactly 60 degrees. It, 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 it'll always be a little more than the 180. And the amount that the spherical triangle's angles add up to more than 180 is called the spherical excess of that triangle. But that is the way you do your, your omnidirectional geometry in our universe. In a function of angles, you're, you're relating the three parts of a triangle. You have uh, six parts. You have three angles and three edges. And we do it in terms then the perpendicular and then the right angle. And we have the then the relationship between the side nearest to the angle and the side opposite to the opposite side or whatever it is. These are ratios between and in, in, in the, in the sine or, or cosine, whatever it may be. Uh, these relationships between the side adjacent and, and the side opposite, or whatever it is. These are ratios. And you've been taught in, in your arithmetic and so forth, you can't divide peas with, with, with camels. You have to have stick to camels or peas. So when you get to trigonometry, they begin to say you have to, you have, you'll be dividing a side which is a line by an angle. <laughs> and that seems very confusing. That's uh, so one reason why trigonometry is considered sort of a difficult idea, because you, you also start t teaching the kids plain trigonometry if you start. But the fact is that. spherical triangle like that. Here's the center of the sphere. And what we call the arc is simply the central angle. The length of the arc depends on the radius. What is unique is the angle. It's a, it is an angle. So we have, we have central angle, these central angles. So the, this arc is, is the terms that say that that's 60 degrees central angle. So we say the arc is 60 degrees. The point is it's the central angle. We're dealing in angles. You have surface, three, three surface angles and three central angles. It's all angles, so you are dividing angles by angles. <laughs> so when we get to talk, if we if we start the kids off in the in the round, we were had we were dealing angles with angles, and it would not seem as ridiculous when you try to put it on a plane and sit where one thing looks like a straight edge, and where it is really an angle. So I said, if we start if we start our things in the proper way with with the whole whole and with, with actually operationally, with, with experience, you would not run into the difficulties you do in education where you're trying to oversimplify and, and talk about this plane, which is an impossible affair. All right. I said to the child that he has drawn three, four triangles. So he was on the earth and, and we were standing here and he drew his little triangle and I said, you've drawn four triangles. Quite clearly, he's drawn a great big triangle. I make it clear that he's drawn the big one. He said, I didn't mean to draw that big one. Well, the point is, you have. It's quite amazing. But this is a basic complementarity in our universe. And when people go doing the local pollution, they are doing the big things, too. I find society able to peel off and, and think about just what it is doing. It's been able to rationalize its, its own unique behavior and say, feel it's all right, not realizing. I want you to realize the inexorability, the absolute fundamentality of the fact that he's made that big triangle. Every time you do one of the little ones, I assure you, you're doing one of the big ones. Every time. You say, I'm, I'm so small, it doesn't affect the universe. It's affecting the universe in a very, very big way here. 
So he said, well, where are the other two? Well, this is a sphere. As viewed from inside, it's, it's a system. As viewed from inside, it is concave. Viewed from outside, it's convex. And concave and convex are obviously not the same because energy impinging on the concave concentrates the radiation and energy impinging on the con con convex diffuses it. Concave con concentrates it. They're obviously not the same. So there is a big and a, big and a little concave and a big and a little convex. There are four triangles. They're absolutely completely unique. <coughs> you can't make less than four. So you're not only going to be, every act you have is not only has its circumferential effects on the local system, but also is affecting the universe inwardly and outwardly. Uh, when, uh, I'm, I'm get, giving you this to get you a little feel about it when, when we're going to get into, into general, really general system comprehensive. We have to take care of then the, the, the circumferential differentiations and the omnidirectional differentiations. And they, they become comprehensible and very, very powerfully so. When you say, I'm going to think about that, <laughs> you're, you're immediately separating something out from the rest of your experience, that, that, that that you're thinking about. And in doing so, all the that's, all the think about it are systems. And they may be you as a system, or it might be our Earth as a system. As a characteristic of systems that they subdivide the universe and all the universe is outside the system and all the universe is inside the system a little bit of the universe which is the system itself okay anybody find anything wrong with that the system divides the universe and all the universe is not not in the system outside the system and all the universe is inside the system and a little bit of the universe which is the system itself which divides the universe and the inside us and outside us That's, uh, uh, this is what all your thoughts will be, and you try to say, I understand something. You want the connections between the different points of that thing. <laughs> and it, it'll turn out to be, it is, it's polyhedronal, it does have the insideness and outsideness. Now, I'd like to think about something else. We, we find the difference between engineering and general public calling the engineers, the really greatest difference is that the engineers know that every action has a reaction and, and, uh, and, and the public pays no attention to that. That when you're, when you're walking along like that, you don't think that you're pushing the earth backward, but you are. <laughs> and you, you're so tiny and the earth is so big, it doesn't, doesn't count. But the engineer finds it does really count and it counts in a very big way and that's by virtue of that we get to that fundamental principle by virtue of it, which we're able to have our propulsion in, 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 uh, in rocketry. And right, every action not only has a reaction, but since engineers thought that way and, and, and became quite successful in doing so, we've had a great reorientation of science, which came about with the speed of light measurements. And though we have the speed of light measurements, we don't have people really philosophically articulate about the significance in any degree to compare with Einstein's thinking. And he had his associates like Max Planck and others who were brilliant, brilliant in their thinking. But Einstein will be the most outstanding of them. And I'll talk a little about what he, he realized in relation to the significance of the speed of light measurements. First place, when I came to Harvard before World War I, the Newtonian classical science was, was absolutely it. And, and Einstein was, uh, was a name and, and it sort of a, it was, a, it was sort of a, fa a very fancy and, and sort of a joke kind of thing. There was, there, was some, there was some very erudite people that understood Einstein. There were 10 people that understood Einstein. So there are these 10 people on Earth who had some kind of a new idea. But uh, as far as populists went and, and as far as the general academy went, they didn't have to pay much attention to it. And so 
I found my Harvard intellectual world still thinking in a, a Newtonian kind of manner, in which to Newton, all this, if, if it's a clear sky, there are the stars, and the stars are always there. We had what we might call instant universe. And Newton, Newton thought of instant universe. Newton thought of then simultaneous events. And, and that, is, that is the great difference of uh, the Einsteinian thinking was to, Einstein said, well, now we find that this light has the speed and it takes eight minutes for the light to get to us from the sun and takes us four and a half years for the next nearest star. And the information we have now is this star I'm looking at over here, I'm seeing a live show taking place 30,000 years ago. The light just got to me from 30, it took 30,000 years for the light to get to me. So I'm seeing the live show taking place 30,000 years ago. Right next to it is a star, you're seeing a live show 7,000 years ago, and next to it is another star 300,000 years ago. So Einstein said our universe is an aggregate of non-simultaneous events. And that, this is a very fantastically important realization. So he said, I also then came to, to a Harvard scholarly world which thinking instant universe therefore also thought and, and knew about entropy, that every local system loses energy, your great second law of thermodynamics. They said, our universe is an instant system, and as a system, it losing energy too. It must be, it's implicit, and therefore our universe must be running down. I came to a universe where, I, as I came into the scholarly world at Cambridge, the uh, universe was running down, and anybody who spent energy was simply accelerating its running down and, and was just getting into more trouble. So the, the very fundamentals of, of what you might call cons conservation, the conservative was that, that anybody who and, and, and instigated change was, was anathema because he was wasting the energy and we were all going to get into trouble in a greater hurry. Things are supposed to stay at rest. Newton, what was Newton's first law of motion? How did he phrase it? A body persists in a state of rest or in a line of motion, except it's affected by other bodies, but it rests as norm. What, are, what is the norm of all your economic charts? The baseline is your norm. What is it? At rest. No change. According to all the, our, our charts, and everything that's going on is, is abnormal. We're getting more and more abnormal. I'm going to be in the moving uh, television tonight with Arthur Clarke in New York. And, and, and a man named Toffler, and Toffler has something called future shock. He's taking all these curves, an like, accelerating set of events, and saying, gets to a point where it's going to be intolerable, and all of humanity is going to die from future shock. <laughs> now, all the curves have been doing this for a very long time, they call the ski curves. They are, everything is continually in acceleration. But the point is that the norm is wrong. And when we go to Newtonian world, where Newton, uh, Einsteinian world, where he finds there's a speed of light, the normal in vacuum is 186,000 miles a second. This is normal. Any other speed is lesser. So all you have to do is take all of your charts, you have them now, simply turn them 90 degrees, and you find that we're in a, we're in a, in a tailspin, just about to crash and we pulled out in a straight and level flight. We're just getting going to be a little more normal because our speed is 186,000. That's it. That's the speed at which you're, all the atoms are working in your brain. Every one of your brains are somewhere around a quadrillion times a quadrillion atoms operative in beautiful coordination there. This is the operation speed. Far from going into future shock, we're going to get a little more normal all the time. <laughs> Show you. Now, once you recognize that there, you're not dealing in an instant universe, then the engineer's action and reaction are inadequate. You find not only does every action have a reaction, but every action has a resultant, and the resultant and the reaction are not the same. Because there has to be some duration of every event. It can't be instant. And the engineer was saying it quite inadequately. So that when we think about a vector, and a vector is a is an experience, it is a line of experience, and it represents a mass and a velocity of, of some event that's taking place in, in our observation. There has to be an axis of observation to be your head and your feet. In relation to it, there is an angle of, of, of action. 
and the length of that vector is mass times velocity. It's, it doesn't go to infinity at all. It's, it's always discrete. So here's this vector of this length of line, this angle in relation to some axis of observation. That's a vector. We have a, this would be a, and we find that none of the, the reaction and the resultant are never at 180 degrees to, to the action. All you have to do is think about a, a wake of a bolt. You see there's a wake which is quite different from the bow wave. Bow wave re, re, being a resultant one and does quite a different thing from the wake one, the thrust. But uh, it, they, those waves are always going off some angle other than the 180 degrees. This is a vector model of any event. It's always three parts. The center would be the action. One end is a reaction, the other is a resultant. And there will be some, there will always be, they won't be in a plane either. There'll be, there'll be, I found the corkscrew that you saw when all those geodesic lines, that when the gravity was operating and the wind was operating and so forth. And the spin of your ball and the low pressure on one side. So this is a typical energy event. Here's another typical energy event. Now, I'm going to uh, seem seemingly detour quite widely, and you may say, this man never going to get back where I have these two energy events, but I got them in my hands so I won't forget them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's very appropriate in our inventorying, and I'm reconnoitering to suddenly get things in very powerful interrelationship where we don't miss anything, don't miss any variables in our comprehensive thinking. How many in this audience are familiar with the word synergy? Hands, please. That, that was, somebody help me count here. Stand up, Ed, and help count. And don't mind, please keep your hands a lot. Quite a bit, 60, 70%. Count, count the ones whose hands are not up. Whose hands are not up? Go the other way. <laughs> who's not, who's not remembered? It's about 90%. It's about, certainly 90% are familiar. I'll tell you, I've asked this question methodically at 263 universities and colleges around the world. And the average university audience is about 3%. And uh, an average public is at less than 1%. And, and all politicians, no percent. <laughs> uh, I've really asked it a whole lot, so I really know. I'm asking an uh, honorary chemical society in the University of Minnesota, 100% hands. And, 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 Biochemist, so I'm not. I am surprised. Uh, this tells me I'm talking to a very well-informed audience to have such a high percentage of hands on synergy. At any rate, the word synergy does mean behavior of whole systems, unpredicted by the behavior of any of their parts. It is is the only word that means behavior of whole system, unpredicted by the behavior of any of their parts. And inasmuch as it is, is not a popular word, uh, and university audiences, only 97% are not familiar with the word, it certainly makes it perfectly clear it is not a popular concept that there are behaviors of holes unpredicted by the behavior of their parts. So I'd say, I've, it's perfectly clear to me by my question asking of the audience, really quite large audiences around the world, that it's perfectly clear to me that the word synergy, or the concept that there are behaviors of holes unpredicted by the parts, is not entertained popularly. Think of it changes no stronger than its weakest link. All I have to know is about the weakest link. All I have to know is about my one brick and I pile another brick. There's really a des popular desire manifest by the newspaper man when he talks to scientists. Is that the building block of the universe? Is that the key? He's always looking for mon monological uh, uh, explanation. The terrific desire in power of society being all by himself to be able to make himself important enough so that he couldn't monopolize and, and, and comprehend. So he wants a, a one a sort of a single, single phase uh, uh, explanation, this bias on one side of a line. The one side is right, you're wrong, I'm right. Okay. Uh, now. Synergy. I'm going to give you the simplest uh, exp exposition of what synergy is that I know about. 
I'm, I'm, I've used some pretty awkward ones in the past, but I, we come to Kepler, and Kepler observing the stars and, and becoming extraordinarily impressed with the behaviors of the planets of the solar system and finding beautiful mathematical regularities apparently operative in, in, the, in the total orbits of the planets and finding this geometrical regularity saying these, these planets are very far from one another, no strings between them, how can they coordinate? How do you explain them? It's really quite a question. He's the first to ask that question. So he had to assume that there was some kind of a force operating between them because they're manifesting this beautiful regularity. There was something coordinating them. And, and because nothing you could see touching, there had to be some invisible force. So he made a working assumption there was such an invisible force, and, and using it, he then began to get into more and more of the mathematical observations and made some very extraordinary uh, discoveries. Of, the, of some of the geom ge geometrical regularities of the solar system. However, we come then to Newton, and Newton then making experimental demonstration of this mass attraction. Best way to, to understand this mass attraction would take two inert material spheres. I would take ivory, which seems to be a very good one as far as we, we don't recognize very, very low chemical elements as metals content in, in the ivory. So we make two ivory balls and piece them together out of the ivory chunks and make them in two spheres, both about two feet in diameter. And they will... Uh, <coughs> I'm going to hang these two spheres, which are two feet in diameter each, which means their radius is one foot. So I'm going to hang them two feet, two inches apart. The point of support will be very many feet above, maybe two, three hundred feet aloft, and then we'll hang, hang them side by side. And the space between the hang is two feet, two inches. We measure the distance between them masses here, and we find that there's no two inches left there. there maybe it's around an inch and three quarters between them. And now we move one of the balls one inch towards the other in the point of support. You'd originally left two inches of thought there, and so you ought to be halving whatever it was. It may be some other strange, very vagary, so it probably ought to be halved. So it was an inch and three quarters would be out, ought to be down now seven eighths of an inch apart. It isn't so. It's down about half an inch apart. Newton, Newton found then that the when we halve the distance, we fourfold the attraction. Because he was talking to a world that was illiterate at the time. He wasn't talking to the world. He was really only talking to other scientists. He wanted to say it in the most accurate manner. So what he... I'll, I'll go, I'm going to make our experiment a little different. I'm going to hang these two spheres and do it experimentally until I've got the point where there is one inch between the two of them. Now I'm going to move one of them an inch away so they ought to be two inches apart. <laughs> and we do. But instead of it going to two inches apart, it now goes to two, two and, a, and a quarter inches or somewhere in there apart. Otherwise, as it went away, if you, if you halve the distance, you fourfold the traction. If you double the distance going from one to two, you, two to the second power is four, you reduce the attraction to one, one fourth, what it had been. So he spoke about the traction being in terms of the inverse ratio of the second power of the relative proximity is stated in terms of their respective masses and, and radii. But this is such a complicated kind of a statement that the average human being does not get it. Something wrong? We now understand why he said it that way, because he said he was just talking to scientists and he, and he wanted to go going away so he could use the word second power, so it was the inverse ratio of the second power as it went away. Okay makes it perfectly simple to you when I say how the distance you fourfold the attraction. Now there's nothing in one of these spheres all by itself that predicts or could in any way predict is going to attract or be attracted by the other sphere. Absolutely nothing. There's no way you could possibly know this happens until you have the two spheres. This is synergy. <laughs> behavior of holes unpredicted by the behavior of their parts. And the fact is a completely unpopular concept. <laughs> 
makes it clear to you how really very remote our public really is from understanding this the integrity of our solar system integrity of, of, of everything in our universe is 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 implicit in this synergy now no sooner have we then discovered the synergy and this mass attraction then we get to the point where mr newton and uh, no other scientists interrogate him say why i don't know what, what is it? You know what it does, but you don't know what it is. What it is and why is absolute mystery. Does. Now, having discovered then that physically that we don't have any continuums, we only have local energy events, really all the events themselves, and they, they get to be found beautiful regularities once we discover the event, and then within them we find beautiful regularities. But each one of them is surrounded by mystery. So uh, we are permeated, we're surrounded by, we're permeated, we're bathed in mystery. <laughs> the beginnings of science are absolute mystery. I find that this, this lack really of the, the total thinking and, uh, as, as where, where society uh, has gotten so, so, so ignorant as to get so pragmatic as to talk about a dialectic materialism that only I really know about physical, all atheism, all these things come out of the convi conviction society, all you really have to know is about this material thing. So, that, I think possibly the most mysterious of all the my mysteries is the regularity we find once we, we begin to make any measurements. There they are. And the regularities go on and on and on. There's complete integrity of the regularities within the, 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 the discoverable. Now, I spoke about then man in his ignorance, really thinking himself responsible for the universe and, and, and that he's running the whole show and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm not very deeply impressed now with how much he's doing and what he really knows about. How can he know about it? He doesn't know he's making the big triangle. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing at all. <laughs> But I'm also impressed that we are given the, the, the faculties to discover these regularities and to, and to employ them. Now I'm going to come back to uh, giving you that mass attraction, which I find to be primitive and, and, uh, so, uh, and our great integrity. <laughs> that we, ha we have also then something called fundamental complementarity. Fundamental complementarity in physics is an expression that artists, artists incidentally, pay a lot of attention to the, what the scientists are saying, and, and I'm told that the largest number of subscribers to Scientific American are artists, that they really follow with great interest what the, artists, what the scientists are finding out, and they employ his language, <laughs> it appeals them very much. It's nice and so simple and clear and direct and, and elegant, and the, the artist likes to use it, and they often use it for expression about what he's doing in his painting that may not be really uh, have any any very great similarity to what the scientists really talking about. But I find the scientists themselves so highly specialized that they, they themselves do not tend to think in very big ways and, and, and uh, you would, might find quite a number of scientists who do not know the words, what the word synergy meant. Their, their specialization just didn't involve it. Now, complementarity as an expression that appears in 1922 in physics. The scientists who were perfectly aware with the electron, which they gave, they gave a, a negative value to, having a positron, we have, we, the, we, we have the scientists aware of a positive and a negative concept as being very, very prominent in nature. But they're assuming falsely in the, in the physics for a long, long time that the positive and the negative simply were always mirror images of one another, and it was called parity. So there was, there was a strategy in doing large, important calculation, astrophysics and so forth, of assuming a, a doubleness of a universe, a positive and a negative, but you assume that they were just mirror images. So all you had to do was to multiply by two, and, and you had everything taken care of. But it's only 1956, and that's only 14 years ago, that we have the Nobel Prize being given to, to 
from young physicists, one Japanese, for their disproof of parity, demonstrating that the complementarity was not mirror image. <laughs> there was a fundamental irreversibility and so forth. And, and so that suddenly, I would simply say, it's certainly anything but a popular awareness today that while there is complementarity and there's a fundamental two-ness, that they're not mirror image of one another. <laughs> I think just the, the uh, way that stated the Nobel Prize, that, that this proof of, of the con conservation of parity, that's, all they, that's the way it's expressed, would not be very popularly understood. But the point is we are dealing with a universe where we have a fundamental complementarity of non-mirror image phenomena, so that there, there's a unique, unique two-ness. There, there is a fundamental of, of, of two-ness, and, 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 and the, the, two, the two parts are not the same. They're not mirror image of one another. So we have in most recent times, in most recent inventories of, of our physicists, particularly astrophysicists, uh, and trying to, astrophysicists tending to look at things in big ways, and our National Science Foundation publishing the latest findings of the of most comprehensive thinkers periodically, we have the astrophysicists noting the analysis of not only as we used to in the past of all the inventory of chemical elements of, of the various stars by use of the spectroscope, but in inventorying the terms of the now the isotopes and developing the total inventory of relative abundance of isotopes in the universe and starting the hydrogen enormous amount and, and there's a descending then there's a there's a very abrupt shoulder and there's six very abrupt shoulders in this inventory going down this stasis and they call these magic numbers these these sudden uh, eccentric peaks we have the physicists then talking about the chemical elements in the in this region of the universe of our earth tending to go run from the high order number of uh, uh, elements in the, in the periodic table and the, and the high numbers of high number of isotopes down towards the low ones. But we have our, our astrophysicists who are doing this work saying that no matter how much things come apart, or else, then the fact then that, that our, our, we have a coming apart of these going from the high order such as uranium down to a lower order number of chemical elements, separating several of them. Because there are high orders and they all have their specific life, there has to be some place in the universe where the high orders are created. <coughs> and so they, they've made a working assumption possibly that the, the high order chemical elements are a consequence of, of the implosive forces in the stars at any rate they are, they are, they are, they confront us, there are those higher numbers, to, uh, therefore, while there, we, we have a, a local running downhill towards the lower numbers, separating out, they also then ask physics, it points out, we do not come apart beyond a certain point. That there, we get down to fundament, the fundamental complementarity where the proton and the neutron always and only coexist. Therefore, the, 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 the astrophysicist's latest, latest thinking has to say that all the kind of talk that you and I used to hear about a universe having a start, starting in absolute chaos and, and gradually countering all probability, bringing about roses and, and lilies, um, we, we went from chaos and to the, the words of primordial, before order into an order, and we had the notion of scientists resting order out of chaos. But we have the latest thinking of the astrophysicists is that there never could have been this order because you can't get to less than the proton and the neutron. You can find out the parts of the uh, proton and the neutron. They do have small energy side effects, but, but the proton and neutron always and only coexist, and one is interchangeable in the other, but they're not the same. They are interchangeable very much as the isosceles triangle might be interchangeable into the scalene triangle, where there's, again the sum of the angles approach about 180 degrees. Therefore, the, their balance is in that 180 degreeness, but you can turn one into, into the other and vice versa. You're two different scalenes, which should not mirror images of each other. They say then the proton with its electron and its anti neutrino. 
and the neutron with its positron and its neutrino. These, these two, are, those are the side energy behaviors of the, the proton having, you really look at this, my energy effect, because my hand would be the proton and be its electron and, and its anti-neutrino, and this is the neutron with its positron and its neutrino. And each one of those in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the modern quantum physics, each one of these is called one half spin or one half a quantum, one half Planck's constant. Each one is one half. So here are the models of, of these two. And they, do, they not, not need to be mirror image of each other at all. The angles could look quite, quite differently. But now I'm going to, because each one is a half of a quantum, I'm going to put them together. And I'm going to have to put them together in, in a very regular manner. I'm going to t take the end of either resultant or, or, or an a reaction. I'm going to take an end, and the end must always come to a juncture. I call this male, and this is female. I'm going to have male goes to female every time. His male, that's fine female, his female. That's the female. I have another male here, I've got to find another female. I'm sorry to say the part of my juncture is going out here. Then I have another male to satisfy, and here's a female. So here we have tetrahedron. And because each of those are half, half quantum, this must be one quantum. In other words, one quantum would be six vectors. Right? It's very interesting because this is also, if I want to have a system, I can't have an inside and an outside of less than four points. So the minimum, this would be minimum system. And it's such is really very impressive. Now I'd like to also to you think about a necklace. A necklace consisting of a number of tubes. The outside of the tube could be any shape you wanted. It could be China dolls or anything, but the center would be the tube where the thread goes through. I'm going to take a number of these tubes, uh, and they're aluminum tubes where I want, and have a string running through them, make a great long necklace. And the necklace is, is notable uh, uh, as a pattern in its flexibility. It, it, is, it, it is very unstable. It's dra therefore drapable about the neck. I'm going to take one bead out after another, which is one tube after another out from the luminous, a set of aluminum tubes, and can string it together again, fasten the string together again. And it gets li a little less drapable. It gets fast, so awkward where one's tube is sort of sticking out like that, hanging over your shoulder and sticking out here. Then I'm going to take out and finally only have four tubes left. Looks like a square. And you find that it is So here, here it is, a square. <coughs> and that square is completely unstable. Drape, it's drapable over here. Okay. It's still a necklace. Now I'm going to take out one more tube. We're down to the four. I'm going to take out one more. And suddenly, it's no longer flexible. You can suddenly st absolutely stabilize. And you find this very interesting because those angles, what was, as they took, uh, as the necklace flexed, the length of the tubes was never changing. The only thing that was changing was the angles, wasn't it? So that I'm down now where the angle, the angle is changing. Suddenly, in this condition, because each one of these is a lever, there's that, our friend, mass attraction. They're, they're pulled towards each other. They're, 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 one is a water and the other is a boat, if you want, as the action-reaction resultant. But uh, they're held, they're in, in, intimate to one another. They're held together like this. Now, 
Bosnia is a very tough piece of rubber. The further getting closer would be fairly hard for me to manipulate the angle. The further I go out on the levers, the easier it is to manipulate, isn't it? So what I have in the triangle is we have each side, because every action has a reaction, there's a push-pull to every such structural member. So this structural member, with minimum effort, stabilizing the opposite angle by getting hold of the ends of the levers. So each side of the triangle stabilizes the opposite angle with minimum effort. And this is what fundamental characteristic physics finds that nature is always operating in the minimum energy expenditure phase. It's always using the most economical. So here's the most economical st stabilization fact. It's the only stabilization we can have. We can't have, there's no polygonal stability other than that of the triangle. So anything you say, I remember, you say, I recognize that. You recognize it by virtue of its structural pattern. There's something, there's a pattern reliability. Pattern reliability comes back then, structurally, must be the triangle. So anything you say, I remember, recognize it, the rememberability is going to be Im implicit in the triangle. That's where it begins. This is then what I call structure. Structure would then be, this is a complex, is a complex <coughs> energy relationship which is self-stabilizing. It's regenerative, it's self-stabilizing. That is a triangle. Therefore, we come to, this, by the word, I'm going to put another pair of these together because <coughs> I had a, one lacking joint. Here's that male going to the female. Other male to female. Male to female. Got two members and members. Here. Oh, no, that's right. Tetrahedron. Okay. Our friend Tetrahedron. So, Tetrahedron is a system because it has inside and outside this, and it and consists of triangles, therefore, it's structure. So, this is, this is then the minimum structural system. <laughs> and also turned out to be one unit of quantum. <coughs> this would be very impressive. We have, uh, we have a visualizable uh, fundamental <coughs> of, of our physics. Physics does not require such vis visual models, conceptual models. But I find there is conceptuality here. All right, that, that structural system is very interesting because I could have, a, incidentally, another structural system where I have a, at each joint here, we might have four triangles around each corner. If I do, I get what's called the octahedron. You aren't familiar with octahedron, <coughs> eight, eight triangular faces. Around each corner, there's always four triangles on the octahedron, eight triangular faces. Northern hemisphere, four triangles, southern hemisphere, four triangles. Always four around each corner. You can get five triangles around each corner. That makes it the icosahedron. Every corner, five. You can't have six around each corner and be a system because it become 360 degrees or a plane and would not come back upon itself to be a system. It's a requirement of a system to return upon itself to have insideness and outsideness. That's why systems are concave inside and convex and outside, due to the, the, the always taking out some angle of vertex. So the total number of structural systems you can have, all triangulated and having insideness and outsideness, would be tetrahedron, octahedron, and icosahedron. Those, that's the limit of stru basic structural systems in our universe. I, wa I want to get you to having something I said very early in our talk, where you have the, you have a total, total. This is all that can be in our universe in the way of structural system: tetrahedron, octahedron, icosahedron. If you see a cube standing up, just make a cube out of one of these things. You find it falls down. The only way you can make it fall up, it falls, whole, is by 
putting a tetrahedron in it. How do you do that? If you make, a, say, a cube of these sticks with flexible corners, it immediately tips over. The way you make it stand is by putting, it's got, every cube has six faces. So we go to this corner and we put a, a diagonal like that, so that triangulates this here. And put another diagonal here. That triangulates these two. Have another diagonal going down to this corner here. Then have another diagonal going up to this corner here. And another diagonal coming over here. What we've done is to triangulate each of the faces of the cube. And when you do, here are the six edges of the tetrahedron in the six faces of the cube. So that simply is a tetrahedron making you stand up now. <coughs> every, every cube has two tetrahedra in it. So there's the other one here. So there are always these beautiful two tetrahedra involved in every cube. And so when the cube is stable, that, that is the way you stabilize it with an extra minimum weight. And that's why you saw the first biplanes, the right brother biplane, to see the, these compression struts and the crisscrossing. This is typically the picture of the early biplane. Make it stand up. OK. It is a quality, then, systems. I want to, I want to make a, I go start with a flat plane and seems to go to infinity. But I'd like to make a system out of it. In order to do so, I have to take out some angle. So I take out a little angle, bring these two together. Bring these two together like that and so forth. They keep taking out angle. That's exactly the way I made this, this map, by taking out angle. You find out the amount of angle you take out. These are called sinuses. Supposing you want to skin a pig or you skin any animal and, and you like to lay it out as a flat rug all in one piece, you'd have to slit first and then you slit at some angle to that first slit. And you keep cutting it open like that. Then if you want to bring it back again from the, being the rug and stuff it, you can bring those, cor those corners, keep bringing those, closing up the sinuses. You find that the amount of sinuses that you take out of any system, whether it's a crocodile or a peg or a giraffe or an icosahedron, is always 720 degrees. And so that turns out to be something very exciting. 720 degrees of very, because we have a convention of, where we use 360 degrees is, is unity. So 720 is two unities. You take out two unities. What are the sums of the angles of the tetrahedron? It has four corners, and each corner has 180 degrees. The sums of the angles of, the, of a tetrahedron, regular or irregular, 720 degrees. What you take out of any system, uh, take out of seeming infinity to make it a system or a conceptual set, is always 720 degrees or one tetrahedron. Otherwise, now, next thing I'm going to call it. An angle is an angle independent of the length of its edges. Therefore, a triangle of consisting of three, tri three angles, a triangle is a triangle independent of size. Tetrahedron is a tetrahedron independent of size. Here we have conceptuality independent of size. It's a very important matter. But I have then, this is the minimum structural system. So what I take out of any seeming infinite, infinite plane to make it a, a, a structural conceptual system and understandable is always one finite tetrahedron or one unit of quantum. So I simply say to you that the, the local conceptual set plus one finite tetrahedron, and there's your universe. We have our physicists re-examining re all experiments, finding energies are, are inter-transformable, interchangeable, and so forth, that uh, the energy is conserved. We have a finite physical universe. I'll go further than that, just to say what we mean by our metaphysical universe, the universe you and I are dealing in, as I can speak to you, which is absolutely weightless. And that is 
all of our experiences begin and end. Whether we wake up, whether we're born, it's always packaged. <laughs> and, and therefore, being packaged is finite, just as, uh, as the physics, all the individ individual finite packages. Therefore, an aggregate of finites is finite. So our, our universe, even the metaphysical, is, is, is finite. But man used to call infinite, I call finite but non-unitarily conceptual. This is permitted by, particularly, it's required by what Einstein began to re remark regarding non-instantaneous universe. What did he have remark? He said, if it's non-instantaneous universe, we have the different observable parts of the universe, which are non-instantaneous, are each one of them overlapping, transformative, each one is an event which transforms, it has its beginnings and endings. So we have a father, a ch somebody being born, then they get to be a father, all enough, they have their children and grandchildren, then he dies. There's overlapping of this life with the other life, so he, he's a transformation, energy, manifestation, transformation. And therefore, Einstein's definition of his physical universe was that it was an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partially overlapping events, transforma transformative events. And that, that definition, he said, can only be a scenario. It is not a single picture. That is the definition of a scenario, an aggregate of overlapping and only partially, only aggregate of non-simultaneous and over, partially overlapping events. Right? As a, a de definition of a scenario, then it's perfectly clear that one frame of a scenario doesn't tell the story that's told by the scenario. That is, the one picture of the caterpillar does not foretell the picture of the butterfly. Nor does one picture of the butterfly tell you the butterfly can fly. You really have to have large segments of, of the scenario to get any, any kind of clue to, to, to uh, what is going on. So to have any understanding about our universe, you would have to have fairly large segments of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the script. Now, because it is impossible then to tell the story in terms of one frame, such a question as what's outside outside about our universe is, is an, is an, uh, is an in unintelligent question. <laughs> it's like saying, which, pick, which word is the dictionary? It, 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 just, it, it is really a, it's asking for special emphasis on just an, an aspect. It cannot, will not work. So you can only really talk about our universe as then this aggregate of non-simultaneous and partially overlapping events, but each one of them, it, the events are always finite. Therefore, it's an aggregate of finites. Therefore, it is finite as described. <laughs> so we have then what man used to call infinite, I call finite but non-unitarily conceptual. <laughs> which is the consequence of the Einsteinian observation. And what, it, what man used to call finite, I call definite and definable. And the difference between the definable and the finite is one finite tetrahedron. <laughs> but it's, uh, it is simply a conceptual one. <laughs> but it's uh, just uh, completely regular. So we have, now we have a way of treating a total universe on a finite basis. We want to get to a comprehensive general systems capability. <laughs> We can start with total universe right away as finite, and we can get the irrelevant ex external, ex internal tetrahedra and so forth, getting down to the, the finite set we're, we're considering. So that's all you really do in, in your bidding is to get rid of irrelevances. And you find the irrelevances as we begin to say, what do you do when you think? You discover that what you consciously do in your thinking is not to start and light a bright light in a vacuum bottle. <laughs> but what you do consciously is to dismiss irrelevances. That's your part. <laughs> you, so that the thing that you've said, I'm going to consider, is the only one you do. Say that, never mind that telephone call, never mind the thought. Every one of us has had the experience of one another saying, you know, what is our friend's name? You know, we both, yeah, we, you say, I know, of course. And you can't remember it right now. Tomorrow morning, you're in the middle of a meeting, and suddenly Fred Brown comes in there, and you didn't mean to look for it then, but it, the messenger comes back. You, you had said what was the name, and, and some other hour, and Fred Brown came into my messenger, brought it back to me, interrupting what I was doing at that time. In other words, we have the experience of slow rate recoverability, retrievability of information. 
particularly on the names. The other kinds come back, many of them, much more rapidly. And you and I are going down the street and say, what's the name of that tree? My mother told me about that. And then they forget you said that because I have to catch my plane and so forth. You keep asking yourself questions, forget yourself asking questions, but every time you ask that, you send messenger back and all of a sudden you're trying to go sleep and maple trees are coming in and you've gone to ask that three weeks ago. You know? So when we, I, I find that we are continually uh, having messages coming in, in, in seemingly very irregular and irrelevant ways to intrude on what we do when we say we're thinking. So what do we say I'm thinking? It's when I'm holding off these messengers that are trying to, to come in with seemingly relevant information and like putting the grass aside and suddenly there, something becomes evident to us. So I say, once I discover that well, my conscious part of thinking is holding off irrelevances and holding to one concept I'd like to hold in there, that what happens is then I find the irrelevances fall into two main classes. All the experiences which are too large and too infrequent to in any way tune in with the relative frequency of the set that you're considering. Because I find frequency and size are the same phenomena. So it doesn't fit our size. And then there are all the irrelevances which were too small and much too high frequency to be able to even be differentiably readable. <laughs> and at, at the magnitude that you and I are considering. So I find that all the relevances fall into... Uh, the outward and inward set, the, the uh, too large and too small, and because our experiences are inherently omnidirectional, our observations this way and our earth revolving, and our, therefore my dismissal must be omnidirectional. So I send the big ones outwardly in all directions, and I send the inwardly, inwardly in one direction towards a common center from many directions. So this leaves me a, a lucidly relevant set <laughs> that is highly clearly tunable. As we get to it, I also find in my kind of thinking out loud that I'm doing with you, you'll see me tempted time and again within the amount of time available that there is what I call a tantalizingly almost relevant. <laughs> 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 so because there, there is a twilight zone of inwardly and outwardly, and if I work fast enough, I just give you enough more to make, it, make it, you begin to feel the way I do feel about the information we're getting. At any rate, this begins to, this immediately produces a geometry for you. <laughs> there, and there are a number of the points involved. It's always topological. There, it, is, it is a polyhedron, so many vertices, and, 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 and there is our fundamental geometry. So I find that when we get into the basic topology of all the different geometries, regular or irregular, we get to where we are dealing with some basic structures, as for instance, tetrahedron, but tetrahedron can be joined to other tetrahedron corner to corner as in the gases, or it could be joined together two corners, it hinges very much as in the liquids, or it could be joined three corners as in as, as crystalline, or it could be quadrivalent, where it doubles up its strength, doubles the vectors all around as a, going from light carbon to, to a diamond. But then I can get the face-to-face, -face, like a triple bonding of, of, of the rigid, of the engineering one. Then it looks, so you only see, you only see a, six faces, two of, them are, uh, two of them are hidden. So I have to watch our topology, whether we're dealing in the basic structures or getting in, the, in these complexes, uh, which are really our compounds. So I then say to you, the next very exciting matter is that because there are no continuums, no, no continuous surfaces, and there are only in the individual energy event, the sphere as defined by the Greeks as a surface equidistant in all directions from a point is non-demonstrable in physics and, and would be con completely contradictory to entropy because if it was a surface equidistant in all directions from a point, there could be no holes in it because you came to the rim of the hole, there, there would be a changing radius. Therefore, it, 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 it posits a complete separation of outwardness of the universe into two parts, outside the sphere and inside the sphere with no connection between the two. Therefore, it would uh, it, it could do away the rest of the universe. It would be adequate to itself. It would not be part of, of, of the, uh, the entropic and, and, and the anti-entropic kind of, of income, outgoal of energies we can experience everywhere. Therefore, I'd say that the only way we really can divine the sphere today 
in the terms of what we know of physically by universe would be an aggregate of events approximately equal distance approximately all directions from one approximate event. That's the closer you'd get. And by the time we got to measuring these, there'd be a lot of things out of order. I mean, considerable discrepancies. So we only have, we have them inherently a set of points, and the, the geodesics between those would be bring about polyhedra. So that, this is what really brought me, as I got in my geodesic spheres and domes, into then these most economical relationships with the most points, and, and simply brings you back into an omnitriangulation. As you get into such very high frequency point interrelationships, then you get to beautiful observation, which is that. I told you, you always take out, there's always that sinus of 720 degrees, which is to say that the sums of the angles around all the vertices of any system, no matter how complex, how spherical it may appear, will always be the numbers of vertices, vertices times 360 degrees minus 720. Hmm. Always so. Therefore, the long-held concept that a sphere for an infinite moment was congruent with a plane to which it's tangent does not hold. <laughs> Once you realize that there's, there's this beautiful de difference in here, I'll tell you then also I find the sums of the angles of any system, no matter how complex it may be, again crocodile, the sums of the angles around all the vertexes will always be a number divisible evenly by 720 degrees or by tetrahedron. Now we're getting this angular topology all of a sudden, it gets to be very, very powerful matter. <laughs> Where we, and, they, and that every time is one unit of quantum. You can find some very beautiful uh, coincidence here where conceptuality is beginning to come into our physics in a very, very important, powerful way. I will review for something for you in relation to our world game that is going to be important. That is that... When, when Priestley made his determined to try to isolate fire by putting on a bell jar and was faithful about measuring, weighing the material that he put in on the bell jar which he ignited, then came out with products of this where the water vapor and the ash weighed more than what he th thought he put in. And we have Priestley not explaining this himself, but Lavoisier explaining it by saying that everything that was under the bell jar had not been properly weighed. At this time, men, as far as chemical elements went, chemical elements, there were only 12 of them known to human, human beings at, at that time. And most of them, they were all metals, they were very easily recognized by the weight they were thought of, and, and they primarily the crystalline condition, except for the mercury. They had other kind of elements, these are mystical elements of fire, earth, air, and water. But of the chemical elements of, of, of the alchemists, these others were metallic. For, for the Vossier to think of the nothingness under the jar, the air, as being a chemical something, and a plurality, he said, it is not only a something very fundamental. It's a plurality of something very fundamental, and the plurality of something is very fundamental. I've separated. It was an extraordinary mental jump in view of elements out of this time being something visually recognizable and highly tangible and weighable. That nothingness. And right, his assuming then that one of them is separated out and joined, and, and he made it oxygen, and then he went on to demonstrate that, uh, that he was able to separate the oxygen from the mercury and, and mercury oxide and, and get the pure mercury. The, the, the iron oxide was uh, as rust or the ore and it separated out the oxygen there was as metal. With this extraordinary contribution in, 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 in terms of understanding metallurgy, understanding what man has seen for a long time, seen fire, seen steam, but suddenly now understood what it was. Understood it discreetly, chemically, metallurgically. Therefore, it was really, it, there was now an atmosphere uh, in which it was, it, uh, the de development of the steam engine was implicit. You couldn't avoid it. So the steam engine came along very rapidly. And with the steam engine and the steam engine in the boat, we had the great pirates who were running the world I've spoken about earlier, 
no longer have to wait for wind in their sails and able then to outmaneuver and way outproduce the people waiting for wind in their sails and getting very far ahead. And this gave them such wealth that they put up their funds and, and this is what really started the funding of science in, in, uh, in England, the Royal Society. And we have the scientists now being said, the, the, the power, power structure people say, up to this time, energy has been a, a god, some mysterious phenomena. Sometimes it's Tor, it might be Mercury, it took different kind of forms of gods, but uh, suddenly you've got this energy coming through out of a pipe and you can turn it on and off and make it do this powerful work. What other extraordinary tricks you got here? So scientists then went into their thermodynamics and, and one of the first things they came to across was the great second law of the, the every, any, a, every energy system lost energy. All local physical systems lost energy, called entropy. Now, very shortly after this, we come to electromagnetics. And suddenly, energy is coming through a wire. <laughs> Up this time, a, a man could see that steam. So there was something highly, it was highly sensorial. <laughs> but suddenly, energy is doing work, going through a wire and, and making a motor go around, and you can't see what's going on. We have the literary man, the reporter, the writer, saying to the scientist, Please tell me, give me the model of what's going on there, because I have to have a model to describe. That's what I do. I describe models. I must describe a model to the public and tell them what's going on here. The public is going to be very concerned about the fact that I can send energy by a solid wire over here and do all that work over there. There's nothing going to affect them more. They've got to understand it. The scientist said, we're very sorry, but we can't really tell you about this because it's invisible and uh, we, don't, we can't see it ourselves. And, all we know is that, that if you have make another coil around here, uh, uh, then we get a different result. And what we do is it works in the magnet, moves a lever, and we get we get quantitative quantitative results by changing the cross sections of the copper wire and, and making so many wrappings, or so many coils, and so forth. And and they said we get on very beautifully arithmetically, and we can really now make predictions. We, and we try to foretell in terms of those mathematical <laughs> results, and we show they seem to be very, very reliable. So that uh, we can get on all right here, but there really is no model. One, one scientist made the mistake of saying, well, something like water going through a pipe, and, and that's where the word electric current came from. And the other scientist jumped on him very hard because he said, this really is not a proper analogy and the water won't run uphill and, and then this, this current, if you're going to call it that, does go uphill, goes anti-gravity. Pays no attention to gravity, apparently. So uh, the scientists retracted uh, back then and then they make, made more and more measurements and finally they came to one measurement where they found energy demonstrating a fourth power re relationship. And with this fourth power relationship, they said, oh, we have x, y, z coordinates, and we have width, breadth, and height, and, and now, and so I, th this is one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, but I, we can't make a four-dimensional model, and because and, and nature is demonstrating a fourth power energy relationship quite clearly, she's not using models. And this fact made them feel great. They said, the generalized case for models is gone. We don't have to worry about models anymore. So in the middle, mid, mid 19th century, science went off models. <laughs> now this has a very great relationship with what I've been talking to you about, about the scientist feeling. He doesn't have to worry about the seeing the sun setting. He said, what I see is no, means nothing to all. Models mean nothing. Uh, it's all a matter of figures. Nature is only using figures. Nature is only just mathematics. So we, we've gone through a century where, where science was saying that the physical universe is really just mathematics. There's no models. We, there are schematics which are very convenient when you're doing a problem, but, uh, but don't, don't get confused by my schematic at all. There's really not any model like that. Uh, nature doesn't have a model like that. However, I became very excited in 1917 also, the idea that I said, I don't think nature has a department of physics, a department of chemistry, and a department of biology, and, and has to have a department head meetings to know what to do when you drop a stone on I think she only has one department. I think she has only one coordinating system. And, and we're getting more and more powerful microscopes. And every time we do, I see Nathan has a model that she doesn't come to some threshold where she doesn't have... She keeps right on with very beautiful patterns. They, they, they're very tantalizing patterns. So I, I think that, that physics is wrong. Science is wrong in saying nature does not use models. 
and I'm very eager to find out whether we can't find what those models are, but I'm perfectly sure they're not going to be ghost cubes and so forth. They're, they're going to be something to do with the vectors and energy behaviors. And, and so I began to pursue that, that kind of thinking. Now, that brought me into this topological, vectorial topology. And, and modeling has, has now developed an important way where I began to use tetrahedron as unity. And obviously, and when you use tetrahedron as unity, <coughs> volumetrically, and say that six, six, six vectors at one unit of quantum, then we find then the tetrahedron which has, has those six, would have, say, one, is one unit of quantum, both in terms of the vectors, the energy represented by those vectors, and I'm going to call this volume is one. Very interestingly, then, when I have a octahedron, octahedron and tetrahedra complement each other to fill all space. Tetrahedra won't fill all space by themselves, and I'm sure that the uh, Plato and, and, the, and, and, and his confrères were very, not only were they tantalized by what we call the platonic solids, but uh, they like cubes because cubes fill all space and keep filling all space with it. And, and if you had a really flat earth, it was very nice because you could pound cubes right up and you fill all space with it. But if you're dealing with spherical earth, start pounding out cubes, it doesn't fill all space at all. They begin to uh, go pulling away from one another because they do not go out that way. None of, the, none of the perpendiculars are sphere parallel to one another. So it is a perfectly satisfactory kind of an idea in, in an all planar world, but uh, not with multidimensionality. However, tetrahedra and octahedra combine to, if I bisect the edges of that tetrahedron interconnect, you have tetrahedra and octahedra. There's four corners here of tetrahedra on faces, on the eight faces, on four of the faces of the octahedron. Four of the other faces are not covered, so they're the out, tri outer triangles of the four faces, the ones that are visible here. So we have, we know that when we double the dimension of a geometrical form symmetrically, if we double the, the linear, then the surface is 2 to the second power of 4 and the volume is 2 to the third power of 8. So when I double the size of the tetrahedron, its volume must be 8. I take away 1, 2, 3, 4 corner tetrahedra, each one of the volume of 1, so 8 minus 4 equals 4. So the octahedron has a volume of four. When tetrahedron volume of one, octahedron has a volume of four. In the same way, it becomes very interesting that you discover that the octahedron itself has six vertexes in it. One, two, north and south poles, and one, two, three, four around the equator. We in interconnect those, those six vertexes, and we get the x, y, z coordinates. That is, a square a section through an octahedron is always a square. And the central angles here are all 90 degree angles, where they cross. So I will take, here is an uh, octahedron with the, this uh, triangle, and I'll just draw it over here, that's that triangle like that. And then it has, at the center here, 90 degree angles. This is what I call a one eighth octahedron. I can take it out of each of the eight faces of the octahedron, this point being the center of the center of gravity of the octahedron. That's one eighth octahedron. If an octahedron had a volume of four, and one eighth octahedron will have a volume of one half in respect to the tetrahedron. So now I'm going to take a regular tetrahedron and I'm going to put on this eight, each of its four surfaces here a one eighth octahedron. That's exactly what you have here. In look at the purple, the purple, purple um, tetrahedron. Then on this corner here, here's that ninety degree corner, and here's an, you put four one eighth octahedron on the f four faces of the tetrahedron. Four times one half would be two. So two plus the volume of the tetrahedron, which is one, and you find the cube has a volume of three. Where tetrahedron is a volume of one, where tetrahedron has a volume of one, octahedron has a volume of four, cube has a volume of three. Now, these beautiful rational values are appearing. If you started with a cube, the tetrahedron comes out, and then a rational number, and the octahedron. But when I'm starting with tetrahedron, they're all coming out beautifully rationally. And 
we find that if you're counting space with cubes, you're using up three times more space you need to use up. If you're counting in terms of octahedra, instead of having, when you bring cubes together, you get this kind of uh, the 90 degree angle at the center. But if you're bringing octahedra and tetrahedra, which are all 60 degree angles together, you get the hexagon. So you get you got six six hours in your clock instead of four hours in your clock. Just going in one plane. But going omnidirectionally, you get much more in your clock. So you find that when you're using tetrahedra for unity, they will collect around a common center. In my shocks. Our universe and our experience is omnidirectional. We have then gravitational and radiational being <laughs> convergent or divergent omnidirectionally. Therefore, we come to what I call a vector equilibrium. If you have a hexagon, would be a common cross section where these six vectors are all explosive forces going outwardly. Therefore, they become the mass attraction decrease. They go off to be independent. But the same six are, are matched by six other vectors of the same value. And these are now end to end and continuous and come back to themselves. Therefore, they close themselves. Therefore, they're in a better arrangement and they, they will hold it together. <laughs> I find then that the, the implosive is always superior to the explosive. <laughs> this makes a form when you take Spheres, let's have the circles around circles. We get the six around one, which is simply our hexagon. <coughs> and you can get another sphere sitting up on top of here. There's a nest. And you get another one sitting on here. Another one sits on here. And I can get three sitting on the other side, where the other ones would be on the other face at the in here. We get 12 spheres around one. As we, when we do, we get, this is, this is the closest packing of spheres. And that closest packing of spheres, 12 around one, gives me what I call a vector equilibrium. And it looks like, like this. We have a plane like this, and there's a hexagonal plane. Oh, yeah. Put this. There is a. Can you see a hexagonal plane going like this? Going to the center. There's a plane like that. There's a hexagonal plane here and a hexagonal plane there. There's, there's four hexagonal planes crossing each other with a common center. And they, they would simply be what you get. Uh, how, there's one like that, there's one like that, there's one like that, and then there's a equ equatorial. So we have, this is an omnidirectional vector equilibrium and balancing just like that. We have the same amount of vectors holding the system together. They're the same value, therefore, equilibrium, but there is, this becomes a basic model of, of gravitational and radiational. Where we're dealing in, I had, I had a circumferential and, and a radiational, which we have to always consider. Now, in the terms of that, this, this has a value of 20. Its volume consists of, here's a tetrahedron here, you can see it. There's another tetrahedron here. Each one of those triangular faces a tetrahedron. There. There are four tetrahedral faces in this, this hemisphere. They have a volume of four times, uh, of four in total. Then there's one, two, three, half octahedra. That's square faces. So three half octahedra, three times two, six. So I've got 12 for this hemisphere. And no, excuse me. Tetrahedra, one, two, three, four. 
There turned out to be eight, eight tetrahedra in the total thing and six one-half octahedra, which gives you then a total of 12. That's the total volume of the vector equilibrium is 20. Where tetrahedra is unity, and uni unity for the vector equilibrium is 20. That is unity. When you look at cubes, you see the following pattern, where you, you now got the edge module is 2, then the volume of cubes is 8, the 8 around the common center. When, when the vector equilibrium has an edge of 2, then it looks like this. Each of the triangles, each of the squares will have be so subdivided. When you do that, and its volume is 160. When the, when the, this means that your hexagon is divided like this. As what do you call it, the, the frequency of the system is 2. The radii and the chords are the same. System the frequency is 2. When, when you see the square, like, the square like this, you, you say it's 1, and then you say this is 2. But when, when this, this system reads 2, its volume is 160. 160 is equals then 2 to the fifth power times 5. When you're using tetrahedra, you can make fourth dimensional models and fifth dimensional models and actually make the models when you're using tetra or, or quanta. Because model, this now accommodates all that's been ever discovered dimensionally, energetically wise, energy wise. So we find full modelability returning as we get into, into this. So that this, this suddenly makes it something very exciting coming up. And suddenly, you know, that's your world of the television that, that we find that modelability is returning here vectorially and, and, and coming out in beautiful numbers. Now, for a great many years, I found physicists, particularly the young, young physicists, very excited by this kind of relationship to find the regularity, but saying we will get nowhere until we identify Planck's constant. They said, where does Planck's constant fit in here? And I didn't really know until fa fairly this last year, I suddenly found it. Found it. And it, it, it has to be very exciting because If you, any of you are students of Planck's constant and get into all the different experiments made and made, Planck's constant, and there, are, there are quite a few different numbers that have come out in different, by different physicists and very reliable work approximating one another, but their number will be 6.65 or uh, in this vicinity here somewhere, and, and then they have this times minus 10 to the 27th power. And this is times one gram, which is, it was a gram being the, the cube of water, and one gram second. And the amount of expansion you would get, because the gram second to the second power, and to the second power because, as Einstein, as when you're radii are increasing the other linear, then the surface be increasing the second power of the other linear. And therefore, Einstein's radiation constant of C, C to the second power, because it isn't just going in linear in vacuo, but it's expanding as a wave as light does in all directions. Therefore, at the C to the second power. Same way, then, the gram seconds are given in terms of the second power, or the rate at which the amount of energy in this cube gram of starting reference to water in the old days can be expanded. And we have Planck's constant as the figure <coughs> of, of convenience to, to explain the radiational results in the terms going back to the centimeter gram second system. Well, then you get to a cube, a cube, mind you, of, uh, of, as, a, as a basic a, a cubic, cubic centimeter and of a specific weight. Now, the relationship of where unity is they used to have unity in the terms of the cube, but I find it is in terms of the tetrahedron. But, but as far as radiation goes, it is the vector equilibrium. And the, it is a, the vector equilibrium is the value of 20. And the cube, we find, is a value really of 3 in that system. So the relationship of 3 to, to 20 is, our friend, 6.666. 
Now you'll find that the gravitational constant, uh, all their measurements of gravitational constant, <coughs> are always just a little better than the 6.666. And the, and, the, and the radiational constant just runs a little bit less. All, all of them, they come in somewhere in here. So if we add the two together, all the averages, they'll come out, our friend, 6666. And, and as I simply find that the, they're simply, here, here it is, and the system fitting in with it here vectorially and, and quantitative-wise. So that the gravitation seems to be a little more effective than, than the radiational, and the very integrity of our universe seems to be implicit here by virtue of the arrangement of the vectors. Well, I've taken you through quite a lot, and we're still a half hour, and I would like to go over to looking at something about the very specific, our world itself, which I haven't talked too much. I've tried to get into terms of universe and into, to get you in the frame of mind of total, uh, s total systems and how, how we could proceed mathematically. We do have a mathematical uh, system, apparently, a, a coordinate system being employed by nature, which is rational and uh, which we, we can uh, then d d deliberately dismiss irrelevant uh, quantities and, and keep holding the ones we are now inspecting we'd like to have important results in relation to. But we do start with our synergy, the behaviors of the holes not predicted by the parts, and, and realizing, for instance, that's where, how do we get to a metal? Well, a, why, why is an alloy, why is chrome nickel steel 50% stronger than the sum of the strengths of all this tensile strength of its, of its, of its, uh, of its uh, component elements? Why? Simply because take two tetrahedra like that and bring them together, you get eight stars instead of four stars. It's the same center of gravity. There's our friend the cube. And each of the stars is nearer to each other in terms of second power relative proximity, remember? Second power relative proximity, of course, it's holding together. And I can get inside of that one another one. And I keep interposing stars symmetrically with other stars. And that's all you can do in any of the alloys. They must be symmetrically interposed. And so as you get greater and greater proximities, our synergies are operating at that second power. So you can really understand it very rapidly. You don't, you don't understand the mystery. But as you know, that this is the regularity that's implicit once you've discovered the synergy itself. Okay. Now, you're playing world game, you're wanting to do more with less, that kind of alloying becomes of the greatest importance, obviously. A chrome nickel steel, for instance, made possible engines which could handle the amount of heat you had to release in order to have a jet. <laughs> The suddenness of the release brought about a fantastic heat that melted down or, or cracked up yesterday's engines. Chrome nickel steel made it possible to have stability, structural stability at that high heat that made it possible. So chrome nickel steel is the essence of why we have, we're able then to, to have jet and why, why our world is shrunk in the way it's been shrunk. Going right back to a basic synergy and a mathematically understandable synergy, really model-wise. Model and so forth, and really topologically understandable. And I want to also point out to you that in this vector equilibrium, it's perfectly clear in all our crystallography and all of our phenomena that this equilibrium, the nature does not stop at the point of equilibrium. Again, going back to my early Navy days, our earliest submarines, we used to be so fearful about the handling of them as you fill your ballast tanks, you have this submarine standing uh, 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 with no headway on at all. So you fill your ballast tanks. Well, the point is that this is a very dangerous condition to get the equilibrium. Somebody happened to throw a monkey wrench over here, the whole thing could nose over. You learned about it with the airplane because we got down to what we call the stall. <laughs> the stall is when you come to equilibrium. And equilibrium, anything can happen. <laughs> and nature insists on having something happen. She refused to stay at the equilibrium, so it's going violently in one of the other conditions. So. That's why you must not slow down below a certain point with your airplane. The same way, then we learned that to, to dive, our, dive our submarine, so have, have motion on so you didn't get into the equilibrium point. Equilibrium, nature refuses to stay out. Therefore, though I have a geometry of the equilibrium, you're not going to catch nature really disclosing it. This is why, again, the <coughs> scientists seem to be rather fortified about models, because she's always going to be one side or the other. She's going asymmetrical, but she doesn't go infinitely asymmetrical. She only goes relatively asymmetrical, up to the point of the, that's 186,000 miles a second. That's the limit. It's about the greatest asymmetry you're going to get. As you begin to take energy out of the system in cryogenetics and get down colder and less and less energy present, then this, this geometry begins to, to emerge and gets works in, really into visual, visual presence. So that uh, 
I want you to understand that I'm not saying to you that you can find nature staying at these models, but these are the, this is a model of reference that she is using, and it is a, ration, is a rational system. Now, in relation to trying to understand our own planet in terms of our, our, our own spaceship Earth in relation to that great universe and, and getting down to some of the inventorying of the chemicals in, in the biosphere, what do we have on, what have been designed to put on board here to keep this regenerating that life for the two million years we've had them here? Quite clearly, when you look at a globe, uh, I've done this with students quite a number of times. While you say I'm seeing a hemisphere, if you try to read this ocean word here, you can't read it. You can only read a quarter of it. We can only see really a quarter of it at any one time. You say, well, maybe if I get a bigger one, I'll do better. Well, I just say, here's your own Earth here. How well are you doing that? You see, the bigger it gets, the worse it gets. It really gets down to a certain uh, re readability and to get to the end of the distance that you're going to hold your arms and so forth. This is about the optimum we've gotten to with these globes, around the 18, 18 inch or somewhere in there. It's just about it. But then you're still only seeing one part of it. So I'd like to be able to see the whole, and I found the Mercator and all the methods of projection, polyconic and so forth, very objectionable because there's really very great, very great uh, uh, distortion. I found it possible, and I'm not going to go into much about it except to say that I said if I could take going to basic triangles, which are then fundamental, if I could get to what is the largest number of subdivisions of a, of a total system where the paths are all identical. Well, there was our cross-heat. You couldn't have more than five triangles around the corner. So there's a 20 faces. So I could say then these 20 faces are the minimum where you get all symmetrical. I, each one of them can be divided by the perpendicular bisector into six right triangles. Those six right triangles times 20 gives you 120. And the Babylonians discovered those 120. They, which they said six are positive, six are negative, because on a, on, a, on a concave surface, a convex surface, one would be positive and the other negative would not nest in the, each other. So they found 60 positive and 60 negative. That's where their number 60 begins, and they try to identify all degrees in time. They try to get times and, and circles and so forth in the same language as that 60, because it was being the largest subdivision of unity, 120 of them. 120 if they are planar and, and 60 if they are one is concave and one is convex. Well, at any rate, this is my largest basic subdivision of, of a unitary surface into, into one, into one uh, geometrical area, tight, uh, fund, fundamental figure. And with that, I want to be able to, uh, that basic triangle, to span continents because, oh, I said, if, if I could take a, these triangles, and I showed you today these spherical triangles where you're going from angles might be 120 degrees, or they might be 300 degrees, might be many. I'm going to take a steel band. That steel band, I can bend it like this, arc, arc it very easily. You know. But let me take three steel bands. I'm going to put a hole in each of the ends of those and put a, a st stiff collar with some, with some cylinder in that collar. I'm going to put a rod, steel rod, got three, three corners coming together and, and making them into a triangle and then have three rods going through those corners. Can you see that? They were, if I take two steel rods going th and one steel band like that, and I, I can pull them like that, the, the steel band will arc and I can pull the ends together. These will be perpendicular to the, to the, to the, to the band, even in, well, it's, when it's seemingly horizontal, and then to a circle, no matter what its size, be perpendicular to the circle. Now, if I take three of these, I have three steel bands, and they're, they're hinged together, the corners, by these, the, by these, by these rods going through them. And I pull the, pull the three of them together, making a tetrahedron like that. It's not only going to make each of the rods bend into an arc, but it's going to make the, the, this arc, arc, arc away from this one, this corner. Gives me the spherical triangle where the angles add up to more than 100, 180 degrees. You see that all right? You really throw on that picture just a minute, it's pretty good at showing that. Uh, take the next picture. Yeah. Now the, all the angles are 180 degrees, the next picture. 
Now see that change it. You can change the change those. The angle mount here can change as you cha as as uh, 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 but uh, by simply pulling the rod and making shorter and longer radii. Change the surface angle, but. It doesn't change the length of the steel band itself. So <coughs> the steel band itself could be uniform scale. And all it does is get bent, and the thing that changes is the angle, not the length. Therefore, I saw that I could, if I got all these data of our Earth into these triangles, for instance, that's the area where you're looking at right now, without sitting like that, and there's North America. Here, here is this triangle. And that, that triangle, I have then uniform boundary scale. It's in a steel band. Either whether it's out flat or whether it's art. The same, same, same interval. So I saw that I could hold my scale around the edge. And the only thing that would change was the angle. So going from the spherical, I would go, for instance, each one of those spherically is 72 degrees of each corner. And when it gets to the planet, it gets to be 60. So I take 12 degrees out of each corner. What happens with this is I have packages of finitely closed. You don't let infinity in the system when you take a cylinder around the globe as with the Mercator. Then you want to cut it open the whole flat, you let infinity right in the crater so that this part of the crater, which is only a mile away from the other, seems to be 25,000 miles apart. Polyconic, you know, always can, all the other systems are now cut open and let infinity in the system and they all dispose error outwardly from, the, from a, either a point or a line or an arc of true contact with the sphere, and the rest, the error is increased outwardly. When you send er error outwardly, it multiplies very much more rapidly than when you send error inwardly. <laughs> Simply because the circle of, of radius 2 is, and the circle of radius 1 and the circle of radius 2 is, is, is approximately four times. So that when you send error inwardly, you, you have very diminishing amount. So if I start with a symmetrical triangle and simply close up each of those triangles, I simply shrink the total surface really symmetrically. That's exactly what we do. I'm able then, I found it possible also, and it took me a long time to find it, to get all these sinuses in the ocean. We don't have any breaks in the continental contour. So I have now the means of showing the whole world at once. Without any break in the continental contours, without any visible distortion of the relative shape or the relative size of any of the parts. That's absolutely correct for your Australia or in relation to Greenland or whatever it may be. So we have, in effect, one world island and one world ocean. <laughs> Three quarters of the Earth is water, and it looks very watery, very landy in this picture, and I don't really feel the water, but if I assemble them all around the water, it feels very watery. <laughs> Whenever it's the center of the picture, it tends to be em em emphasized with your eye. <laughs> So here is a means then of seeing my whole earth at once. And th this, this is that same thing then done like this. And I think you might just pass it around fairly rapidly looking at yourselves and you, you won't find any discrepancy in respect to any globe you've ever looked at. There is no visible distortion of relative shape or size. So we have a very satisfactory way of looking at our earth. Now when you want to show, for instance, the amount of people on board of our earth and you'd like to have, if you're using a distorted Mercator, it's a horrible looking picture in Greenland's very large and, and you put the, the people in proportion, if you actually put so many, so many nails on your map for people, then, uh, then it, you don't get a proper background for them. But here we get a proper background. With that picture, I want you to see what extraordinary relationship we have here of these are the people. Uh, Ed, these, each one is one ten thousand. Three and a half million. Each one is three and a half million people. Because people have very, in recent decades, come from the country into the cities, it's really, really very easy being able to locate the cities. De demographically, we can really show you where the 350 million people are for the first time quite accurately. And here they are. I want you to look at the sparsity of people in America in relation to what we have here. I want you to realize that what we have tended to think about is Africa as a very separate kind of a continent. Because when you're looking at the globe, you can really practically just see Africa. But if you do it really very fast, you'll begin to see what I have here is correct. We have a great quadrangular mass here. Europe, Asia, and Africa are really all one, with, with a lake, lake region in here. Can you see it? And that great quadrangular mass has 88% of humanity. 
There's only 12% 12, 12 over in the, in the North and South America, so I'm totally only 12%. Hmm. And, and we're, we're only 7% of that, and, and we're a very small part of, of the big show. And the kind of feelings we may have about our traffic are very nothing alongside. Just look at the people here. That's where they really are. India is pretty, pretty, pretty impressive, but look, look at China. Think, think of trying to carry on a United Nations without having China in it. What nonsense. <laughs> so. We have found, uh, this would be fairly typical of the things we begin to study in playing world game, we say, quite clearly, life is, what we identify as life is the energetic, some an en energy investment of, of, of some very extraordinary design here. There's an energetic investment. Once the energy goes out, then, then, then it comes apart very rapidly. There's not just the energy of the mass or the weight, because we men have been weighed as they die many times, no weight is lost. Whatever really is, is life is something very much more subtle. Gradually, then there's decomposition, energy comes apart as far as the organic system goes. Chemists are saying we're making all the chemistry of life. When life goes, that chemistry is sitting right there. <laughs> And that quite clearly is, to me, not life. It, it is, it's very accommodative to life. But whatever life really is, it seems to me to be absolutely metaphysical and weightless. I think we've made a great mistake of, of identifying the telephone with the person on the telephone. We're all a bunch of telephones, but, uh, but uh, what you see is not us. I've, I've, uh, I took off 70 pounds a few years ago. I say, who was that? <laughs> it wasn't obviously not me, because I'm here I am. When I weighed in, I only weighed seven pounds. It was still me. <laughs> I've, I've now processed over a thousand tons of food, water, and air since I got started. It became temporary. My hair got cut off, and, was, and was, I say, who is that? Uh, I, quite clearly, I, I am not the, the organic. I'd like to get that out of my, uh, of my argument altogether. I see, however, that what our, our way this, this intelligence functions on board of this planet <laughs> through these telephones, that I'm interested in the regeneration of those telephones and all the other biological regenerations which seem to be an extraordinary piece of design. And as it becomes so, then I find energy is the very essence. And while you and I, the sun is our prime source of our energy, our, our continuing life on Earth, you and I can't take through our skins. The vegetation has to take it in for us. And other animals can eat the vegetation, and we can eat that animal. We've learned to cultivate some of the uh, hybrid, some of the uh, vegetables, so we can eat them along with the fruits. But uh, the most powerful one we seem to get is from 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 the from the meat side. Now, in what I'm saying to you, primarily, regeneration of life is energy. And the way we can get energy from here to there to be useful to life, either to do the work that life is doing or to give the preferred con environmental conditions or to bring about the sustenance one way or another by the energy conversions which physics and chemistry now permit us to do, uh, to employ, by virtue of that kind of capability, then I say getting energy from here to there becomes very, very important. And no way you can get energy from here to there in such an important way as by wire. So we get into the five-year plannings of, of Russia and China, who want, want to really develop, take on the industrialization, which had come so slowly in Europe as not to be really thought of as the total pattern of, of being something quite different from the agricultural. Even though it, come, it took 200 years in, in Europe, it took about 100 years in America, Russia then took this on and did it in 50 years, but by seeing it some totally as a way in which you regenerate life in a, in a, with, where uh, you externalize functions and the functions are, are interusable, inter where I make the glass and now you can use it and I, you can use it or I can use it, extension of my hands. We began to develop inter interchangeability of our function and enormously amplifying their effectiveness by adding energy on the ends of levers to do it, by shunting enormous amounts of energy in, into the system. Therefore, Russia then said, said all the great many people are starving from the agricultural system. We have you know, very bad seasons, there are bad droughts, and, and then there are bad, very bad freezing ones and so forth. 
millions of people are starving. By having energy under control, we'd be able to get there. So they had to make this enormous big leap for industrialization. Absolutely number one on their, on their five-year planning was to get the energy. We find then you have to have, of course, then your blast furnaces and, and other smelting to get the copper wire and the steel mast and the, and the casings of the generators, whatever they may be. So there are a number of, of more or less coincident number ones, but energy was number one. Actually, no, number one in that five-year planning was literacy. You couldn't get anywhere without literacy. I had to be able to really uh, t take on information, employ the, the invisible information. And now with that energy network, say, if you try to compare how fast you can get energy by a pipeline as gas or, or liquid or by freight or oil, ships and so forth, nothing can compare to the, to the electric wire. And the higher the voltage, the greater distance you can deliver it. And the, incidentally, the higher the voltage you go, the more the system, the system becomes efficient, fit, more efficient it becomes. Just looking at something really fairly, fairly superficial to say, I want to look around and, and see where, for instance, longevity is increasing, where birth rates are going down and longevity is increasing simply because the children are not dying at this age between zero and four, where they used to be dying in enormous numbers. They're suddenly not. Therefore, the great population increasing in industrial areas are due to the people who didn't die rather than the new births. And the births are going down, down, down. In America, for instance, between our, our earliest settlers' families and the earliest colonization, we had 13 children per family, down to about two per, per family. And with that, that came, they go down children per family specifically as we increase the probability of survival of the life. And, 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 then, and increasing that by virtue of our controls of energy in one way or another, either to have the heat or to cook or whatever it may be, and, uh, and sanitation. Therefore, I simply say that where we have the highest standard of living, the most high, important single characteristic would be energy. Passive energy and energy coming by energy networks. So that one of the first things that our students doing in playing the world game is begin to I look into the distances which energy can be delivered and how much you have to increase your voltage to be able to deliver and what are the considered practical limits from the outer day going from the old 138,000 volts up to a million volts. And you can deliver 1,500 miles instead of the old 350 miles which we've been doing for the last half century. So that the students began to study that in a very big way. Very fascinating if you also then take the amount of energy that can be demonstrated in foot pounds of work done by a human being running upstairs or running up a mountain with a pack of weight on him. The armies have done this time and again and, and come out with the amount of foot pounds of work can be done by a human being, a young, healthy human being in, this, in a year. So we have what we might call a manpower year. We take the amount of energy being consumed by our economy. Today, we find that, the, that we use it very badly. And, and we use a very low efficiency types of machines. As for instance, our reciprocating engine is only 15% efficient and, and uh, uh, average, and the turbine 30% and jet is 60%. 60 so you double it each time you go from one, one of those types to the other. We are using most of our energy in this reciprocating engine, very poor machines. And now I find that our net make good energy is only somewhere around 5%. So you have to take the uh, 4% have an overall efficiency of about 4% in our total economy even today. Therefore, you have to take the total energy being consumed annually from water power, fossil fuels, and uh, air power, food, and divide it, total, total energy consumed by 25, get it down to 4%. Take that total amount and express it in the terms of the amount of work a man can do in a year, which I then call uh, a, an, a, an energy slave. How much work can he do physically as energy? So I take then these en energies which, we're cons which we are consuming and putting to work in our economy in the terms of the net realized, what I call energy slaves, grabbed out the way I gave you. And I found that when I did these figures for Fortune magazine back in, in 1940, that we, were, we had a, something over 30, about 39, I think it was, energy slaves per each individual in North America but taking in terms of family today, we've gone to something absolutely phenomenal. And our first economic census of the United States was taken in 1810. 
by the Treasury Department. At that time, we had a million human, uh, million families in America, and we had a million human slaves in America. We've gone then from that million human slaves, or one human slave average per family, which was, across every family didn't have at that time, to the present time, we're up to pretty close. Can, Ed, can you give me the, the family figure now? It's somewhere around 2,000. About 2,000 inanimate energy slaves per family. In, in 160 years, we're gone from, from one human slave to 2,000 inanimate energy slaves. And, we, and, and in the meantime, our longevity has doubled. That is, the expectancy of life is absolutely twice what it was. This, these are quite phenomenal figures. So when I put the, onto this same map the energy slaves that are in operation in each of the areas you find in America, with a very small amount of human, human people, you're going to find enormous amounts of energy slaves. By far the largest number of energy slaves are on the West Coast, where we have the fewest people. And they really quite clearly are bound this way. When you go into these energy networks, which are now possible, as the students have been doing, we get into these 1,500 miles, we begin to integrate the time zone. I don't know whether you know about it, but gen generating electricity for others, the, the power stations have to be sure to anticipate the peak loads of any of their customers, because the customers have to don't get the energy when they need it. They say, we'll put in our own generators. That's what the public utilities don't want. So they, they must be sure to generate more than is needed. And, and they're always doing so, but that means they cut in motors, they watch the peak loads very carefully for each day of the year on that average, so they have enough motor on to anticipate what's being on. But then as fast as they're not using it, they cut that motor out. It means they have a great many motors that are not working. But if you can integrate networks between even two cities, then the peaks and valleys of the two begin to get together and you use your motors a little more. And every bit that you use that you didn't use before, then is, is profit. Because right? when you generate it and didn't use it, it was lost. So then you save it absolutely pure profit to, to be able to do so. As you can integrate networks, then, then you, can, uh, you can even out these things and make higher and higher profit. Right now, with this 1,500 miles integratability, the United States, both the pub public and the private sector, which have been holding out against the public sector, put the problem in the computer and found that by integrating with the public sector on the networks and using the new high voltage, they would make a 30% greater profit because they would begin to integrate the time zones which we had not done before. We then find that it's perfectly practical matter to carry on our, our network to Alaska, picking up enormous amounts of water power in, in, the, in the Rockies here, and, and the, this come over to where this goes on up in, in to Alaska to get this jump, that was in the 1,500 miles. Russia is moving this way, picking up this water power all the time. We find per perfectly practical matter to integrate over the over the Bering Straits with Russia. This would mean integrating day and night, and you'd get a 50% improvement in, uh, in the use of your, of, your, of your generating capacity of the Earth. It's just jump like that. Putting this in the computer, which Russia and the United States will have to do, they'll simply say, automatically got to do it. With this energy integration north, north, over, over, the, over here, here's China with all those people. And they're committed to industrialization of 750 million people. Russia only had 150 million to handle. 750, and their number one commitment in their five-year planning is energy. So that they're going to have to put in the computer, do we integrate with this network here or not? You're going to hold off an ideological basic that just don't like the people, or are you going to go for what you really want, your energy for your people? You're going to integrate, of course. And you're going to, so we find right the minute we get in this world game playing this way, find way which boundaries really just automatically break down. We get down to the absolute fundamentals. So there's an absolutely fundamental to Russia and China, energy. You've got to have the energy. So I've, I've gotten very close. I've got two minutes of my one o'clock deadline. And I've, I've given you, gotten you how, how we look at our Earth and how we can see it and, and, and draw any distorted base and how we, how we be sure we're not leaving out relevances and how we can dismiss other irrelevances and how we get in very sharply to each of the things we do. And this gives you the me method which you can then gradually what we're doing now longhand can get in the computer. The last things I'm going to say to you are the following, and you know, I'll say them really quite rapidly. While man has this very little lim limited participation in reality today, he used to think of reality everything you can see, smell, touch, and hear. But since we today just look at great electromagnetic spectrum, and where man can tune in directly with the senses less than a millionth of reality. <laughs> 
So of all the things that are really going on, affecting all of us at, uh, out, out of our it's all being conducted in areas of reality where man cannot see, touch, smell, or hear. For this reason, we are, uh, with our newspapers, concentrating on the physical, the touchable, the smellables, we are, again, to say, very far off base in our dead reckoning of where we really are. Our potentials are very, very high right now. And it's in this great enormous <coughs> invisibility within fact. Well, going through this room now, the figure I've now had updated is about, there are around 200,000 radio programs going through all these walls right now. If you can tune in any one of those, they're right in there. They're paying attention to the walls of your head. Coming in this room, if you want it, you can, uh, coming from some of the satellites that give you where every beef cattle on Earth is. We know right now. It's right in this room. The, the invisible reality, the information right here in this room. You don't have to go anywhere for it. Just don't have to tune in. Get the right set. Okay. I want, this is what we really are uh, dealing in. Rather than, I find that not only do we have this limited sensorial spectrum, but we also our motion spectrum is, is fantastically limited. Therefore, a man doesn't do about, uh, much about anything unless he can see and move. See the automobile coming at him and he'll dodge. If he doesn't see it moving, he doesn't pay any attention to it. We can't see the hands of the clock move. We can't see the tree grow. We can't see the stars move. We don't see the atoms move. We don't see hardly anything. We only pay attention to things we see move. So what we learn in the world game is it's perfectly possible for us to accelerate and decelerate, taking, for instance, great cloud cover patterns, a very extraordinary thing, pictures taken from the Rockies down, looking down over Denver, where you take them at the, at the normal speed of taking the picture, and those clouds seem to be just floating there. They're, they're lacy, they're far apart. You can see Denver down below through them, all right. We accelerate that picture, an amazing thing happens. You see those clouds are literally forming waves just like our ocean, literally cresting over, beautiful waves cresting and breaking. So all, all I say is when you accelerate and decelerate your picture, you can bring things into comprehensibility. So part of the world game is to expect this information and, and bring it into comprehensibility by man, bring it within the sensorial spectrum, within the motion spectrum. We want to do more with less. Typical then would be the fact that there are these different relative efficiencies. I find most people don't realize they're there, that there is a difference between that reciprocating engine and the, and the turbine. Not only does the reciprocating engine then, 30, the turbine's twice as efficient, but the weight per horsepower is about twice as good. And also, so again, doing more with less. All we have to do is really go into a design revolution over here, looking in a very, very important way, and things happen. Furthermore, we begin to discover that all the copper that's ever been mined is completely in recirculation. Only 14% of it has been lost. That's in, in munition ships about an ocean. We'll soon pull that out and put it to work. So the, the copper, which is the correct handmaiden to deliver that energy, gets something just melted up over and over again. Every time the telephone company melts it up, they wire, they get many more messages over the same wire. <laughs> began to go up from one message to, to what at first I think it was 28 and then to 250 and so it went on amplifying. The telephone company said they go on to expand to the whole, to, 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 uh, to equip the whole world without buying another pound of copper. In fact, being copper sellers all the way through. That, that was their statement back in 930. That's where it's gone. In other words, you continually do more with less. And I'll give you just one communication satellite now weighing one quarter of a ton, outperforming transoceanic communication capability of 175,000 tons of copper cable. Those are the magnitudes you're now going to go into. So as we began to play the world game, but uh, Ed, if you don't mind just standing up with me and, and Michael, because these, these are the young people who have been playing, doing this with me, and they began to take over on their own last, and Ed is going to carry on with you. And Michael is going to carry on with you. But they, began last summer, I, I spent 50 hours with uh, Ed's group, 26 students, who never met each other before from 16 different disciplines and, 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 and 26 different colleges. And uh, I spent 50 hours giving them what I'm giving you and, and about, uh, giving you only about three hours worth of it. I went to Europe and these, these young people then began to check over the inventory resource figures that I have, things like that. I'm sure they might be wrong. Having found that the figures were, were reliable, then they began to make their own assimilated playing. And that, when I came back from Europe, they had discovered it was highly feasible. All, every one of them suddenly found highly feasible to make our world work. Absolutely sense. It wasn't, it wasn't something for a thin chance, it was easy. But you can't do it with those sovereign boundaries, for instance. There's things that, there's things that are really highly impeding, so I simply say, if anything in the news tends to disturb you in the way of saying, I see that the old kind of patterns are going, the United States are breaking up, maybe. Uh, maybe you, it is incidentally perfectly true the United States really did lose World War III. It's all over long ago, it's been over a year ago. 
Somebody lost the ability to make one. And, and, and that need not disturb anybody, because this is simply what has to go. But all, this, all the other sovereignties have to go, too. This is just the beginning. It's not going to work until, until it works from all. Unfortunately, China and, and uh, Russia would, would have been able to, glad to turn her high productivity on her people, which she had been promising for, uh, since the five-year plans began long ago, but she had been preoccupied with unexpected war. And the unexpected war, uh, biggest of all, is, is China. And why? Because in developing industrialization, that big leap to have everybody have this group machinery and group energy, you have to go 10 years, 15 years, with a lot of people going to die of starvation. How do you hold people together? How do you hold 750 million people together instead of 150 million as Russia had? Russia found the only way you could hold them together was to say, all the worst of the world is going to try to destroy you. If you make, demonstrate this kind of a capability is so superior to the other older system that they want to destroy you. So you've got to assume the world is your enemy. And the way you hold people together, make them enemies. So China, they said, you can't possibly hold 750 million people together unless you really make them feel the whole world's enemy. Not, so everything to see what is, uh, is America, their enemy, and all the inward is, 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 is Russia, they're your enemy. Russia didn't have an expected to be called enemy. But in order to hold 750 million people, you have to do that. Fortunately, whereas it took 200 years for Europe to industrialize and took 100 years for America simply because it wasn't smarter because it simply started off with the other ones left behind, it had all the advantages of the others' experience, Russia did in 50. China is going to do it in 25. China will probably be coming to affluence as, as quick as mid 70s, possibly in 75. At that point, she will stop talking the war because the war, Mao said this very clearly to two of my friends. Two, two last New York Times men that were there with him, that you really have to hold together in this basis. A friend is a friend afterwards, but, but for, you can't make this thing work without this absolute, fantastically uh, uh, powerful discipline of uh, assuming it's yourself against the world. And right, uh, this will hold on and, and will be the military raison date that Russia will have to hold that posture and won't like it for another five years. But when that's over, you, you can have your world work. Men talk about peace, lovely, there's no such thing, it never has been so far, there could be peace. But what's been called peace in the war, peace in the past has always been the, what, the conditions that satisfied the last conqueror. <laughs> We've always had dying. We had dying due to ignorance. That man born ignorant has to find himself, has to discover that his mind is more important than his muscle. We have here then a pattern of going on in the world I find very, very impressive of what man used to call, I, I, had, I have said, I have two kinds of war, official war and unofficial war. The unofficial war, people just die in the slums, <laughs> in ignominy, Nobody, no, not even being credited for your integrity in any way, made few friends. You have your official war, and you get medals for it. That, that, but dying it was, and, and that's all men knew about. That's why they were wearing swords or carrying a bludgeon or, or a pistol shooting out. Didn't know that there could be enough. They didn't know there was going to be this more with less, which came out, as said, of the sea and the sky, and rather than out of the land, more with mooring. And I simply say to you now that it is perfectly possible for us to have enough for all and we, we could, and on those conditions, and on, only on those conditions, could you really know peace. Man, the, the, it's perfectly clear there could be peace. But it's going to have to come out of success of everybody. It's going to, and I'm perfectly clear it's going to be everybody and nobody now. That's the way this kind, because this is a system and the industrialization only works in terms of everybody. You hear a great deal of talk is deadly about technology, a great enemy of man coming upon him. Somebody say to you, universe is technology. <laughs> University is all, a man that doesn't even know the synergy, doesn't know synergy is technology. There's the inner behaviors, extraordinary complement, and in, inner behaviors, absolutely fantastic. So we have the regeneration of man, we have the capability to regenerate him here. And one more thing I'd like to say, because just because your skin is different color, and that, like something very important to me. So I began to study my world map. The colors you see on here relate to the temperature, the weather. I found geographers tend to show the maximum and the minimums, and that's all they show. But I, I find that there's something very unique about weather, and, and, and here's the way it is. I got the spectrum colors on here. 
the red is a, is a hottest, then orange, and then yellow, and then greens, and then darker green should be dark blue. I'm sorry, the ink, printer's ink was not really, this should get gray, dark green, and then finally into blue, dark blue. Now, on that map, uh, Here is equatorial Africa. It gets just as hot. This is the cold pole of the northern hemisphere, eastern Siberia, Bear Koyans. It gets just as hot here in the summer, midsummer day as it does here in equatorial Africa. How, the difference between places is not how hot does it get, because they get equally hot. The difference is how cold do they get. Equatorial Africa stays like that in the, in the summer and the winter. So the difference is how cold does it get. And the colder it gets, the more annual variation there is. Here in Vekoyansk, where the greatest cold is, the annual variation is 145 degrees Fahrenheit. For every really great variation, you have to have a different kind of environment, so man has to adjust himself to more. By Lake Victoria, he invents a boat, because he needs to cross the water. By Lake Baikal, he invents a boat in the summer, but he invents skates in the winter and, and sleds in the winter, and, and Trans-Siberian Railroad crossing it. Now, the, uh, the idea is, and the colder it gets, the more types of environment man has to adjust himself to. It does not make him more inventive, but he has occasion to be more inventive. So he, when you bring, take a man from here into here, he becomes equally inventive. But the invention chain has primarily come this way, and the great military dominances have been from the cold over the warm, <laughs> due to the, to the fact they've had more kinds of technology to, to take on to, to adjust the environment. Now, on, the, on this map, there are some real surprises because we say here, go north, go cold, go south, go warm. And it looks right, all right in here, it's a great deal of history. But in Europe, it is not so. You go east to go cold. Look at this. Hottest place is, is uh, Portugal, and as you go this way, it's colder, colder, and this is the cold pole of the, of the northern hemisphere. Napoleon didn't know that. Don't know that. He thought he was. You go east, you stay in your own latitudes, you get about the same weather. You might have a bad luck winter, but he was licked by the cold. Hitler didn't know it. He went to Drang nach Osten. He went east, and he went up the cold sea. Nothing consumes hitting power of energy in war as the cold. And, and Hitler's locomotives didn't have the right grease for them. They, they froze up. He didn't have the logistics to cope with that cold. These are the things that have not been understood in our picture. At any rate, I'm now going to put onto here. Little piece, little labels, and each one is matching the color of the skin of the people who live in these areas. And I put them all over, all, all over here, wherever the human beings exist. And you're going to find that simply, the colder it gets, the more the skin bleaches. Simply have to be undercover more and more, and you simply get bleached out, and you have long tribal huddles for a thousand years, not even on another tribe. The chieftain ma in marrying with his own granddaughter and inbreeding special adaptive balance of characteristics are getting bleached out more and more. And the further and the warmth you go, the more clothes they take off. We get to the sailor man going here, and he's sort of half, he, he cross breeds with both. They get here where it gets hotter and hotter, and take off more and more clothes, and you get more, more and more inbred pigmentation. Because you just look at your hands, and the bottom is white. It's purely a difference of the environment, nothing else. There is no race. These are typical kind of stupid things I find, really. I've said I, there's not negatives here that I can't help but feel very powerfully about because you get such insights from playing that world game. And right, I'm pretty confident that as you begin all to play it, one of the most important things I have learned is that you cannot be a good scientist, a good world game player, if you have biases. You just, you don't say that the electron is good and the, and the positron is bad. <laughs> You've got to really understand the beautiful complementarity of our universe and, and how the forces really do interplay. And so that I, I've given you, given you the synergetics, I've given you the way you, where, uh, one more, materials circulating. I did mention copper, but all the, what's been called pollution, the amount of sulfur coming out of all the stacks around the world today exactly matches the amount of sulfur we're taking out of the ground each year to keep the industrial system going, paying a fantastic price for it. And it's all concentrated in that stack. We're going to have to, and each company, nothing wrong with technology, is simply the short sightedness of which man is using it. The, the limited way he's been looking at it, and he's not to be blamed for it. He's, he's, they've been intellectual slaves. We have, everybody's been slaves, been all made specialists. Nobody look at the, the, at the big picture. And so that man, uh, as he begins to really integrate his information, begins to, begins to see these things, that the chemistries are always meant to circulate. At any rate, we're going to have to do this federally, because a big corporation 
said, I can't possibly precipitate that fume and cost it a whole lot of money. And, and my competitor won't do it. He's living in a place where, a city where they don't enforce that. So he just won't do it. So all we say, uh, we understand that, uh, because if the, if the manufacturer, if the city insists on, on it, the manufacturer is not going to move out of please don't go, I need your tax base. So they, they won't enforce it. But we don't have to do it federally, simply federally, simply say, every corporation, you must simply, you must precipitate, you must hold it out of the nozzle, whatever it is, you must concentrate it and save that chemistry for us. Whatever it costs you, we'll keep, you keep tying your books here and we'll deduct that before you pay your taxes. You get a straight tax subsidy. But if you don't do it, it puts you right out of business. But you must hand over to us all the chemistry of the government that you, that you save here. And we suddenly find ourselves in an enormous chemical bank of interchangeability where this is always needed. Every bit is needed and, 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 and very, very high value. What you really save in the way of, of, of just the regeneration capability of your lakes or your rivers, fantastic in its own right. So what government will save by it will be very, very great wealth will be made. Not, it won't be costing anything. I want you to realize that these are the kind of things become very powerfully visible with World Game. World Game then finally, quite clearly, after you get, we play longhand and get all this information. In due course, you put it in the computer. And the computer is going to be able to remember that this, this chemistry is over here and that chemistry is over there. And, and the integratability will be very greatly accelerated. But it doesn't mean that you don't go, you can play it right today and get the kind of information you need. I hope I've given you enough insights to, to, to make it, to make it a, attractive enough to you to invest time. But once you've invest, been investing your own time, begin to play it, you're going to get really quite new feeling about our, our proprietorship of, of our spaceship Earth. I find many things are going to become obsolete that, that have been thought of as something, for instance, we take property, has been a very great, great uh, question in, in all the theories of government, what you do, how about property? I will simply give you, for instance, my own automobile experience. I was seven years old when the first automobile came into Boston, and I, I owned 53 automobiles in the succession. And finally, I began to find my pattern of life is I just live, I live in the frontier deliberately. Therefore, what happens to me usually begins to happen to other people maybe a year later or 20 years later, but I, just a little earlier, that's all, very small difference. I began to find myself having my travel is such that I began to leave my automobiles at the airports and not come back to them. I'm paying enormous rent and never, never come to it again. So uh, I had to have agents go and sell them for me. And what I do is simply, when I come to a new airport, I simply get a new car and keep it for one day or two hours or something, turn it right in. And, and as far as I can see, it, smell, it smells fresh and, and because they are responsible for keeping it up, they, they don't put in the bad parts. <laughs> and so uh, I don't have to, uh, any, any, uh, any uh, wasting my time. And anyway, right, I can see this happening. Almost everything that I've had that used to be called possession, I think the things that I do care a lot about, if they're really worthwhile, they're going to give them to a museum. And, and I find simply ownership becoming more and more onerous because I simply find myself more, more of a world man. And if you become a world man, it just it is onerous to have property. There's much more that could be said just mathematically if you think about the idea of that airspace business and, and we own everything vertically perpendicular inwardly and outwardly, we say, all right, that air it went through, it wasn't that air. So what star were you pointing out when you said my, I mean that geometry, so, because I was just turned, there's not that star there. In fact, the stars themselves are all changing. There's no such geometry. If we, let's say, let's go into I want you to think about a, a, just six faces of our Earth. Let's say the, we have, as, as a cubicle, you can have this, this spherical cube. In other words, you can make six square faces, then they're not flat, Squares, but each of the corners will be 120 degrees of, of the of the because three 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 lines come together at each corner. You have let's call one red and one is blue and one red and the other and green. Violet. So we have the red area belongs to Russia. So, now here's a cube and, and Russia say I own this face of the cube and I own everything perpendicularly below it. it. Means they own all the rest of the cube. <laughs> I just want to realize that, is, uh, that such claims that we have are, are, are completely ge uh, geometrically untenable. I, I find a great pleasure to be able to show these things mathematically are unsound, that we've been able to hold to in the uh, concept of the long flat earth. At any rate, these things I think become more and more dramatically viable and, uh, to society as you play a world game. Thank you very much. <laughs>